At this time, WGN uh, joins the Mutual Network for the presentation of the All-Star Game, which is in progress at the present time. Theo DeRocher, who will guide the destinies of the National League All-Star team this year, has for outfielders such game-breaker-uppers as Mel Ott, Joe Medwick, and Pete Reeser. Pete Reeser leading the National League in hitting with an average of 361. And these men are fortified by such stalwarts as Zena Slaughter of the St. Louis Cardinals. Young Willard Marshall, freshman sensation of the New York Giants, making the all-star team even before he's completed his first year as a major leaguer. Then there's Terry Moore, pretty good with that willow and considered as one of the finest defensive center fielders in the history of the game. And then there's Danny Litweiler of the Philadelphia Phils. In the infield for the National League, there's Archie Vaughn, who hit two home runs in last year's all-star game, you remember, hit them in succession. And when he had hit his second one in the National League ahead, it looked as if Archie Vaughn would be the hero of the 1941 All-Star game. It took Ted Williams' ninth inning home run, which won the game for the American League, to rob Archie Vaughn of being the hero of the 1941 Midsummer Classic. Then there's Jimmy Brown of the St. Louis Cardinals, a switch hitter. That's right or left, depending on whether a right-hander or a left-hander is pitching. Always a dangerous little man up at that plate. Eddie Miller, at shortstop, who hits a long ball. Frank McCormick of the Cincinnati Reds, another long ball hitter, and a good hitter. And, of course, last but certainly not least, one of the biggest power men in the major leagues, Johnny Mize, who's become very fond, incidentally, of those short right field stands here at the polo ground since he's become a member of the New York Giants. The distance from home plate to the right field stands, 294 feet. Not a very long distance, and John has learned how to pull that ball closely, which you have to do to get them into that right field stands, and is very fond of them. There's a 100-foot drop away from that 294-foot sign as the wall out there fades away toward deep right field to the uh, bullpen. It's a 100-foot drop so that in order to get that ball into the right field stands, you do have to learn how to pull them closely. The men back of that plate for the National League is tonight can hold their own with the bat, too. Walker Cooper, Ernie Lombardi, and Mickey Owen. And as for pitchers, looking at it from a defensive standpoint, what more could you want then such men as Morton Cooper, Whitlow Wyatt, Claude Passo, Johnny Vandermeer, Bucky Walters, Ray Starr, and Carl Hubble have been added to that list since Cliff Melton, who was originally scheduled to perform for the National League tonight, came up with a sore arm. Morton Cooper's won 11 games. Whitlow Wyatt has won 8. Claude Passo has won 12 games. Johnny Vandermeer has won 8. Bucky Walters has won 9 games. And Ray Starr, a veteran sensation of the Cincinnati Reds, a veteran from a standpoint of age rather than service, has won 12 games. That group of pitchers, all in all, have won 52 games while losing only 26 among them. For an average of some 667, and that's pretty good pitching. Morton Cooper, who's scheduled to start for the National Leaguers tonight, has appeared in 16 games for the Cardinals this year, has won 11 of them. He pitched 134 and two-thirds innings, has allowed 88 hits, walked 37 men, and struck out 71. And in his string of 11 wins, there have been six shutouts. So if he certainly, if he performs up to par this evening, it's going to be perhaps a little bit too bad for those sluggers in the American League lineup. Of course, that is strictly conjecture. It remains to be seen. Looking at the starting lineup for the National League, Jimmy Brown, who leads off and will play second base, is a switch hitter. And, of course, with a right-hander ready to go against them, Spud Chandler of the Yankees. Jimmy Brown will bat left-handed. Leo DeRocher, as a matter of fact, has... For his first six men in the lineup, all left-handed hitters, playing that percentage angle of a left-handed hitter against a right-handed pitcher. Brown, Vaughn, Reeser, Mize, Ott, all bat left-handed. The first five hitters, I should have said. Jimmy Brown has a batting average of 267 to bring into the ball game with him. Archie Vaughn hitting at 262. Pete Reeser will bring into the ball game an average of 361 on the season. And Johnny Mize has come up over the 300 mark, hitting at 301. Mel Ott hitting at 261. Joe Medwick, who follows, hitting at 344. Walker Cooper, who will catch, hitting at 286. Eddie Miller batting at 270. And these boys are pretty good in the matter of home run production, too, to give you an idea on their slugging propensities. Jimmy Brown has had only one homer. Pete Reeser has six. And Johnny Myers, the National League leader in that department, has 14 He'll be followed by Mel Ott, who has 12 home runs. And, of course, Mize and Ott are very, very accustomed to these stands here at the Polo Grounds, this being their home lot. Between them, they've hit 26 home runs this year. 
Joe Medwick has three home runs to his credit. Walker Cooper, four. Eddie Miller, four. So that the first eight men in the lineup for the National League have accounted for 44 home runs between them this year. And the matter of runs batted in to give you an idea of the hitting strength of this National League team, which in the past has been noted especially for the defensive uh, propensities. Uh, Jimmy Brown has batted in 43 runs. Archie Vaughn, 23. Pete Reeser, 38. Johnny Mize has driven in 63 runs this year, leading the National League in that respect. Mallott has driven in 44. Joe Medwick has driven 55 runs across the plate. Walker Cooper, 26. Eddie Miller, 25. And so with the first eight men in the lineup, they have accounted in runs batted in this year a total of 317. So all in all, you can see from what Jim Britt has told you and from my brief analysis of the National League lineup, the two teams tonight are pretty evenly matched. And one team cannot be said especially to have any advantage over the other one way or another insofar as pitching, defensive strength, or offensive strength is concerned. So what we shall see will be a game in which the cream of the crop of the major leagues, pretty evenly matched, will go to it in this 10th meeting of the National and American League All-Stars. All right, here's Bob Elson. Thank you very much, Mel. Well, friends, from what uh, my two colleagues have told you, Jim Britt and Mel Allen, you can gather that uh, this is going to be quite a ball game. We have two evenly matched squads here tonight, and it should really be a swell game. We're going to pause now for station identification. We're happy to say that our mutual stations from coast to coast have set aside their time, canceled programs with the cooperation of sponsors, so that the mutual broadcasting system could bring you an exclusive presentation of one of America's greatest classics, the All-Star Game. You're listening to the broadcast from the Polo Grounds in New York City. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. WGN, the voice of the people, Chicago. Well, friends, here we are back at the Polo Grounds in New York City. One thing we wanted to tell you about was that the ball game tonight cannot run past 9.10 New York time. Uh, there's going to be a test blackout in New York tonight uh, at 9.30... So the ball game will not run past 9:10. If because of any circumstances beyond the control of everyone, there should be no ball game tonight, this ball game would be played here in New York tomorrow afternoon at 1:30, and the Cleveland game would be played in Cleveland on Wednesday night. In the event that something should prevent this broadcast tonight or this ball game tonight, it would be played here in New York uh, tomorrow afternoon at 1:30, and then the Cleveland game would be set aside or would be set back just one day. In other words, we're anticipating a game in Cleveland tomorrow night at 9 o'clock, and don't forget that your mutual station will bring you that great game, and boy, that should be a classic. From that huge bowl at Big Municipal Stadium in Cleveland, your mutual station will bring you the story of that game tomorrow night at 8.45. Now, I know that someplace across the country there might be some of you fans who are tuning into our mutual broadcast late. Uh, the game has not started as yet. There's been a delay uh, of a bit here, and I'm going to run down the batting order and line up again slowly for you. Some of you are perhaps keeping a scorecard on this ball game, and so we'll give it to you slowly in their teams. So those of you who want to keep an actual card, an actual rundown of the ball game, will have plenty of time to get it in. Let's take the home team first, the National League team. Jimmy Brown of St. Louis, second base. Archie Vaughn of Brooklyn, third. Petey Reeser of the Dodgers in center field. Johnny Mize of the Giants at first base. Mallott, the manager of the Giants, will start in right field. Medwick of Brooklyn, and by the way, Medwick has really been playing marvelous ball for the Dodgers this year. I think that Joe's comeback, uh, although it wasn't exactly a comeback because he played good ball last year, but his the baseball he's played this year has really been something. As you know, he's right up there hitting around 345, has driven in a flock of runs. He hits safely in a long stretch of ball games, and Joe's having another great year. Uh, Medwick will start in left field. Walker Cooper of the St. Louis Cardinals will catch. Eddie Miller of the Boston Braves is going to start at short. And Morton Cooper, the ace of the St. Louis Cardinals staff, who's won 11 ball games and lost three, uh, is going to start for the National League. By the way, looking over Cooper's record, we see that he won 11 games and lost three. He pitched 12 complete games. And one thing you notice about Cooper's record is that he pitched six shutouts. Martin Cooper has six shutouts out of the 11 games he's won. Now turn around on your scorecard, and here is the American League starting lineup. Lou Boudreau of Cleveland, the manager of the Indians, will start at shortstop. 
Boudreaux at short. Tommy Henrik of the Yankees will start in right field. Henrik, H-E-N-R-I-C-H, Henrik, right field. Williams of Boston, left field. Joe DiMaggio of the Yankees in center field. As I told you before, little Dominic of the Boston Red Sox is laid up with a bum back, and he's in uniform, but will not play in the ball game. So Joe DiMaggio will bat fourth and play center field. Then Rudy York of Detroit will bat fifth and play first base. Gordon of the Yankees, second base. Kenny Keltner of Cleveland, third base. Bertie Tebbets of Detroit, that's T-E-B-B-E-T-S, Tebbets will catch. And Spurgeon Chandler of the New York Yankees, a right-hander who's won nine ball games and lost two, is going to pitch for New York. There were three uh, fans, there were three late uh, switches in the uh, rosters today. Uh, as you know, Paul Derringer uh, was laid up and could not uh, take part in the ball game. And we also had another late uh, withdrawal from the ball game, and that was Melton of the Giants, their outstanding left-hander who had a sore arm and couldn't come into the ball game, and so. Uh, there were two other pitchers nominated, and they are Carl Hubble of the Giants, who's down here in uniform for the National League, and also Starr, the great right-hander of the Cincinnati Reds. He was also uh, nominated uh, in place of Paul Derringer. Uh, the other nomination concerned the American League squad, and that was that Bill Dickey uh, dropped out of the lineup, and Wagner of the Phillies stepped into his spot. Wagner, as you know, is a catcher, a left-handed batter, and a very good hitter, and he stepped into Bill Dickey's spot. Bill has been ailing for a couple of weeks, hasn't been in the Yankee lineup I don't think at all until the Boston series, and uh, he's not well enough uh, to get into the ball game. And Wagner has taken his spot. Uh, the umpires, when the ball game gets underway, will be Ballenfant, B A L L A N F A N T of the National League, back at the plate. This is the National League game. This is the National League is the home team. At second base will be Barlick, B A R L I C K of the National League. At first base will be Stewart of the American League, and at third base will be McGowan of the American League. Now, there you have the pitchers. Uh, there you have the umpires. Uh, there you have the starting lineups and the squads. Al Shack, by the way, is just uh, walking uh, back from center field. He's coming out here toward, uh, toward the infield, and the crowd's giving him a hand. While we have time, let me tell you something about this Polo Grounds layout. It's a complete double-decked affair. Our mutual broadcasting booth is in a swell spot here, right back the home plate where we can see those balls break in over the plate. It's in a great spot to see the ball game. And there's a complete double deck all the way around the park. Uh, this has often been referred to as the left-hand hitter's paradise because it's just a short poke down that right field line. As I look down that line right now, I can see the mark is around 290 feet, which isn't very far for a good left-handed pull hitter. It's a little bit farther, however, down the left field line. It's a poke of something like 330 feet, and from there on out into left center field to deep center field to right center field, it is a real wallop. Uh, in fact, it's one of the longest drives to the center field fence of any ballpark in the majors. It's something uh, from here to the center field wall is something like 483 feet, and that is really a wallop. 483 feet to the center field wall, so you can tell what a poke that is. The only, uh, the only spot where the hitters get a break in this park at all, I really think, are down this right field line. Of course, that is the left-hand hitters, those pull hitters, <laughs> who can pull that ball uh, into those stands, which uh, are only 290 feet distant uh, here from the home plate in the ground. There's been a, an unavoidable delay here in the uh, start of the ball game. It hasn't uh, gotten underway as yet. Right below me here is the American League squad. I might tell you, too, that all the American League players are wearing their home team uniform. Uh, the American League teams are the uh, visiting teams, so the American League players are wearing their road uniforms. And right below us here, below our mutual booth, a little bit to our left, uh, is the Yankee team, or is the American League team. Joe McCarthy, who just recovered from a, an unfortunate illness, is back. I talked to him today. He looks in good shape. He said, Bob, we have a great squad this year, and I think we're going to beat the National League again. Uh, Joe is all set right in the pink for this ball game. I also had a chat around noon with the fine manager of the National League squad, Leo DeRocher, who's done such a splendid job with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And he said uh, to me, Bob, we've got the best National League team that we've had in years. This year we not only have National League pitching, but we're going to show those guys some hitting too. And as you can see from the figures that uh, Mel Allen has given you on the National League, 
uh, the National League team this year does carry a lot of power, and anything is happened to have to happen in this ball game uh, when it finally gets underway. Friends, there is going to be a delay. Uh, circumstances beyond our control are going to delay the start of this ball game. And so we're going to leave you here, take leave of you now for just a little while. Stand by, however. We'll be standing by in our mutual broadcasting booth here in New York, ready to bring you this ball game, the all-star game, play-by-play, just as soon as the ball game starts. So just stay right with your mutual station, and just as soon as the all-star game gets underway, uh, we'll bring it to you. And so for just a while at least, this is Bob Elson saying goodbye to you from the polo grounds in New York City and returning you to our New York studios. Our program service will continue in just a moment. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is WGN, the voice of the people, Chicago. Stay tuned to WGN for the broadcast of the All-Star Game between the American and National Leagues, which will begin shortly from New York City. We rejoin the Mutual Network. How do you do, baseball fans across the country? This is Bob Elson talking to you again from the Polo Grounds in New York City. And we're all set now for Mutual's exclusive coverage of the 10th Annual All-Star Game. You hear that announcement through your radio? That's the public address announcer here in the Polo Grounds in New York City calling the official batting order and lineups around here to the people in the stands. He just completed it, and now I'll give you the rundown again for those of you who might be tuning in late. Here's the starting lineup for the National League, and the National League team will very shortly take the field. And then Jim Britt will describe the first three innings for you. Mel Allen of New York will describe the middle three, and I'll describe the last three. Uh, the announcer has just called the official batting order lineup. I repeated it to you before. There's been an unavoidable delay, and the ball game is going to start now any minute. And here is the lineup. For the National League, Brown of St. Louis at second base. Archie Vaughn of Brooklyn at third base. Petey Reeser of Brooklyn in center field. Johnny Mize of New York at first base. Mel out of New York in right field. Joe Medwick of Brooklyn in left field. Walker Cooper of St. Louis is the catcher. Eddie Miller of Boston is the shortstop. And Morton Cooper of St. Louis is the pitcher. His record, as we told you before, he's won 11 ball games and lost three. Uh, 11 of his wins have been shutouts, and he's been one of the outstanding pitchers of the year. You stop and figure 11 wins and six shutouts, you've got something. Here's the lineup for the American League. Uh, Cooper has just come out of the uh, National League dugout, which is down here to the right of our mutual broadcasting booth, and he is going to warm up now with Ernie Lombardi. Ernie Lombardi of the Boston team, he's going to take a few throws, and the rest of the National League team is out on the field, just tossing the ball around, not on the diamond, they're on the field, they haven't got out onto the diamond as yet, and uh, Cooper is going to try a few practice throws from the mound. He's walked out to the center of the diamond now, and here is big Ernie Lombardi of Boston, who is one of the reserve catchers for the National League, uh, standing just back of the plate, taking Cooper's practice throws. Uh, here's Spud, Spud Chandler of New York, who's going to start for the American League. Uh, he's come out, and he's going to get a few practice throws. Well, let's get on anyway with the American League lineup. Lou Boudreau of Cleveland, shortstop. Here's another announcement. Officials contacted Mayor LaGuardia, who gave permission to carry this ball game until 9.30. As you know, if you were listening to the broadcast earlier, there is a practice blackout here in New York tonight at 9.30. Uh, they had established a time as a deadline time on the game at 9.10. In the event of a tie at that time, the ball game was to have been played tomorrow, but because of an unavoidable delay, the uh, baseball time has been allowed to run until 9.30. So the ball game will run until 9.30. Now, let's get on, shall we, with that American League team. Uh, Lou Boudreau of Cleveland is going to play shortstop, and Lou's really been having a grand year. Uh, Spud Chandler is also out there getting in his practice throws. He's standing in one side of the pitcher's mound, and Walker Cooper of St. Louis, or Martin Cooper's on the other side, and both pitchers are warming up from the center of the diamond. Uh, the teams are not on the field. The players of both teams are along the playing field uh, on the side of the foul line side, here to our left and to our right. Lou Boudreau at Cleveland, I think, is having one of the greatest years of his career. Not only has he done a splendid job with that Cleveland ball club, he's really revitalized that club. He's had them playing great ball, 
He has the respect of his players, and he has been playing the best ball of his career. I talked to him in Chicago when the Indians played a series there with the Sox last week, and uh, Lou played wonderful ball. And uh, talking to some of the players on the Cleveland Ball Club, I know that uh, his year so far at Cleveland has been a howling success, even though Cleveland's not in first place. So Bedrow will start it short. Tommy Henrik, the dependable right fielder of the New York Yankees, is going to be in right field tonight. The alternate was Dominic DiMaggio, who they had intended starting. But in yesterday's uh, doubleheader, the Boston doubleheader, uh, Dominic hurt his back. And although he's in uniform here tonight, he is not going to start in the ball game. In left field will be Teddy Williams. Yesterday in Chicago, I talked to Eldon Auker, who's won 10 ball games this year for St. Louis, about great hitters. Auker told me that in his judgment, and he's pitched in baseball many a year, Williams will go down in history as one of the five greatest hitters that ever lived. I asked him what was it that made Williams such a great hitter. And he said, Bob, the thing that makes Williams the great hitter that he is is the fact that he can hit these kind of specialty pitches like knuckleballs, sliders, and sinkers and all that sort of thing right when they're in their motion. In other words, when a knuckleball comes in and starts its particular motion, uh, Williams can hit that ball right when it's in that particular motion that makes the knuckler famous, and he can drive that kind of a ball out of the ballpark. So those specialty pitchers not only don't fool him, but he can time them, and he can hit those specialty pitches, and not only hit them, but he can drive them out of the park. And Auker told me, and uh, he's a pretty good pitcher and a pretty good judge of hitters, that he thought that Williams would go down in history as one of the greatest hitters that ever lived. Now in center field is Dominic DiMaggio. The great DiMaggio, the famous Yankee Clipper, has uh, gotten off to a rather slow start this year. But uh, he's been coming along. Uh, his throwing hasn't been, for one thing, as good this year as it has been in previous years, nor has his hitting been as good. Seeing uh, Joe DiMaggio batting around 270 doesn't look like Joe because you'd expect to see him up around 350. But Joe just hasn't been able to get going at his regular clip. Of course, uh, Yankee fans and the Yankee bosses figure that Joe will get going. He's been in a slump before. But anyway, he's one of the greatest ball players in the game, and he'll be in center field. At first base will be the big powerhouse of the Detroit Tigers, Rudy York. No, he's not exactly the outstanding fielding first baseman in the American League, but he can knock him down. He can get in front of him. And what is more, he can really powder that baseball. Yes, sir, that big boy can really sock that ball and... Uh, his big bat will come in handy in that American League lineup tonight. Now at second base is one of the greatest ball players in the game, Joe Gordon. If there's anything that uh, a great second baseman should do that this fellow cannot do, I don't know what it is. I was talking to one of the greatest men in baseball, Connie Mack, last year. Mr. Mack told me that he thought that uh, uh, Gordon was one of the greatest second basemen he'd ever seen, and that was enough for me. At third base will be Kenny Keltner, the outstanding third baseman of the Cleveland Indians. The catcher is going to be Bertie Tebbets. Here's an announcement. It's about the test blackout. If you couldn't hear the announcement, the uh, public address announcer was telling the fans that the uh, blackout, the test blackout here in New York tonight is going to start at 9.30, and the ball game had previously planned to end at 9.10, regardless of what stage the game was in. But now, because it's been late getting started, they're going to run it down to the actual blackout time, and the customers and fans here in the stands have been asked to remain in their seats. Gotten as far as the catcher, Bertie Tebbets, who's going to be back at the plate in place of Bill Dickey, the old workhorse of the Yankees and one of the greatest catchers in the game. Tebbets is a fine catcher, and he's a good hitter. And the pitcher tonight is going to be Spurgeon Chandler, a very fine right-hander of the New York Yankees, who has had a fine record this year. The uh, pitchers in the American League are Chandler, Bonham, Ruffing, Benton, Neuhauser, Eusen, Bagby, Hudson, and Eddie Smith. The pitchers for the National League are Martin Cooper, Whitlow Wyatt, Carl Hubble, Passaw, Vandermeer, Walters, and Ray Starr of Cincinnati. There's been two changes. Melton drop, was dropped off the squad today because of a sore arm, and Carl Hubble was substituted. Derringer was also out because of an injury, and Starr of Cincinnati was substituted. There was one substitution on the American League squad today, and that was Bill Dickey dropped off, and Wagner was substituted. And now, fans, we're all set for the uh, All-Star game. The teams are going onto the field. The umpires are coming out. The 10th annual All-Star Ball Game is going to be brought to you exclusively by the Mutual Broadcasting System. The umpires have just walked up to the plate. 
the National League team has gone out onto the field. And I'm going to turn our microphone over now to my good friend Jim Britt of the Yankee Network, who will talk to you just as soon as you hear our national anthem. Good evening again, everyone. This is Jim Britt about to bring you the first three innings play-by-play -play of the 10th All-Star Game. As you know, the previous record is six victories for the American League, three for the National Leaguers. And at the moment, there goes the official starting ball being given to Morton Cooper. The rosin bag has already been handed him by the Brooklyn Bat Boy, who is the home Bat Boy for the National Leaguers, just as the Yankee Bat Boy is the host of the evening as far as the visiting American Leaguers are concerned. Walker Cooper is the catcher and his brother Morton Cooper is on the mound. Recently, on the occasion of an Army-Navy relief game at Braves Field in Boston, attended by more than 25,000 fans, Morton Cooper came within two bloopers, two accidental base hits, you might say, of pitching a near-perfect ball game. In addition to that, he gave one walk. That was his third consecutive shutout. Later, that streak was broken. Here is the starting plate umpire, Lee Ballenfant coming over to talk with manager Joe McCarthy of the New York Yankees about some matter pertaining to the game itself. At first base will be Ernie Stewart of the American League. At second base, the colorful Al Barlick of the National League. And at third base, Bill McGowan of the American League. The first man up will be manager Lou Boudreau of the Cleveland Indians. He bats right-handed, has a season's batting average of 302. This is his first year as a skipper, the youngest skipper the American League has seen. He has seven doubles, seven triples, and a single home run since the start of the season. He is one of the most famous athletes in the history of the University of Illinois. He was a great basketball player. His opponents in the Middle West, especially in the Western Conference, insist to this day that great as he is in the diamond world, he was an even greater All-American cage star. There's the roar as Boudreau, who has quite an unorthodox batting stance, starts his position. Artie Fletcher is coaching at third base, and at first base is Bucky Harris, the manager of the Washington Senators. Boudreau crouches. The outfield is just about straight away. Here's the first pitch, and it is ball one. One ball and no strikes to count. The infield is back on the left side. Archie Vaughn is playing just about five feet away from third base. The outfield is fairly deep on the left side with Joe Medwick playing deep in the corner. One ball, Morton Cooper winds up, delivers. There goes a long drive towards left field. That ball is given a real ride, and it is up in the stands for a home run. The American Leaguers lead one to nothing. was the first home run ever hit by Lou Boudreau in an all-star game. It was a long drive that went to left center field at around the 400-foot mark. It was a tremendous wallop off right-hander Morton Cooper and the American Leaguers lead by a score of one to nothing. Portsider Tommy Henrick is up now. Here comes the pitch, and he looks at the ball, low and outside. That is the second time Lou Boudreau has driven in a run in all-star game competition. The score is one to nothing in favor of the American League as a result of his walloping a tremendous homer to left field on the very second pitch thrown to him. The score, one to nothing in favor of the American Leaguers. One ball to count on Henrik. Here it is. Too low. Two balls and no strikes. A tremendous roar came from the throats of the assembled fans here at the Polo Grounds. That would have been a home run in virtually any baseball park in the league, in either league, including Washington's Griffith Stadium. 
The outfield is just about straight away for Tommy Hendrick. Right fielder Mel Ott is fairly deep. Here's the pitch. Call strike. A nice pitch, just buckle high through the heart of the plate. Incidentally, Martin Cooper, like Higby of the Brooklyn Dodgers and Paso of the Cubs, is a jinx-defying hurler who wears the numerals 13 on his back. Paced by Boudreaux's home run, the American Leaguers have nobody on in the top of the first. Nobody out, and the count is one and two. Outside, ball three. Three balls, one strike to count. Cooper is a tall, swarthy, extremely handsome right-hander who many of the Cardinal rooters believe is another Jerome Dizzy Dean. His record so far this season is 11-3, and three, and his streak of nine consecutive victories was just broken. He winds up, pitches, there's a foul ball down the third baseline, fielded very easily by third base coach Artie Fletcher, who flips it to Archie Vaughn. Vaughn is rubbing up the ball. He takes a few steps over toward the infield grass, and Morton Cooper is standing out on the edge of the mound waiting for it. There is one of the American leaguers making a slow trek from the giant dressing room here at the polo grounds over towards the left field bullpen. The count is three and two. The big one just about ready to sail up with Tommy Henrik, the New York Yankee right fielder up. Here it is. There goes a drive that goes solidly into right center field for a hit. Henrik pulls up at first base, rounds the bag, decides to go to second. There's the throw, and he has a double. Center fielder Pete Reeser came in to slow the ball up. It didn't quite have the power to reach him. It was right over the head of second baseman Jimmy Brown of the Cardinals. Henrik rounded first base and very smartly decided that he could take two. He went all the way to second base, hit the dirt, and the play was not close. That is Henrik's 18th double of the year, by the way, but it doesn't count as far as his 287 batting mark is concerned. Thumping Theodore Williams of the Red Sox is up. That was Henrik's second RBI. Strike one called. Williams looked at the first one, which Morton Cooper threw just about chest high, right over the heart of the plate. Williams has a batting average of 348, 18 home runs so far this year, 80 runs driven in. He spread eagles both the major leagues in the power department. The American Leaguers lead one to nothing. Henrik on second. Here's the pitch. High and outside, one and one. Bucky Walters is warming up for the National Leaguers out in the right field bullpen. Morton Cooper has already faced two men. Boudreau hit a tremendous home run drive into the left field stands at the 400-foot mark, and Henrik doubled to right center. He hit the dirt with a nice slide going in. One and one the count on Williams. Henrik leads off. Here it is. There goes a long drive to left center field. Medwick is going deep for it, waiting, and he takes it. There goes Henrik tagging up. He draws a throw to third base, which is good, and he goes back to second. Williams hit a long fly ball to left center. It was taken by Medwick. And here is Joe DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio, the Yankee Clipper, whose all-star record is not star-studded. He has a batting average of 268. Many observers believe that this is the night he is destined to break out into full all-stardom. Low and inside, ball one. Tommy Henrik is on second base with his illustrious Yankee teammate, Jolting Joe DiMaggio standing in that famous wide base of his at home plate. He's waving his bat in the direction of Cooper. The outfield is deep to the left. Medwick has backed up. He is just about as deep as Ott was in right field for Williams. One ball to count. Here it is. Strike call. A good strike. Through the heart of the plate, buckle high. And the count is one and one. One man out. The American leaguers one run. The National leaguers nothing. Lou Boudreau hit a home run on the second pitch. Then Tommy Hendrick doubled to right center. Henrik is still anchored at second. He takes a lead. Cooper pitches inside. Ball two, strike one. Joe was all set to tee off on that. Had it appealed to him, he doubtless would have swung from the heels. But he choked his bat and got out of the way. He and his brother Dominic and his other brother Vince stand with their feet probably wider apart than any other trio of batters, certainly any brother combination in the majors. Two and one the count. There goes a high bouncing ground ball to Archie Vaughn. He holds the runner to second, throws to first. There's the throw to first base for the out, and Henrik, after the throw was made from Vaughn to Mize to retire DiMaggio, took third. Archie Vaughn did his job. He tried to bluff Tommy back to second base. Tommy did not go all the way back, realizing that Vaughn would have to commit himself. And just as soon as the long throw was made from Vaughn to Mize to retire Joe DiMaggio, Henrik took third on the out. Two men out. Bucky Walters is still warming up, by the way. And big Rudy York, Chief Rudy York of the Detroit Tigers, is up. 
He is the first baseman. He bats one below the cleanup slot. Has an average of 278, including 14 home runs. Henrik on third. Two men out. Ball inside. That one very nearly shaved the letters. Detroit. Right off the front of Rudy's chest. He wears the number four. All these players, you know, are wearing their own uniforms. The National Leaguers, their home uniforms. The American Leaguers, their traveling suits. One ball, no strikes. Two men out. Henrik stands in foul territory, just a little off third. Here's the pitch. A swing and a miss. One and one. Rudy swung from the heels on a handle curve ball that came through fast. The infield is back on the left side. Eddie Miller, who has played in 39 errorless games going into this one tonight, which will not count against his National League fielding record, is a deep shortstop. The outfield to the left. There's a drive that goes towards right field. A long drive. And that ball is going in for another home run to make it three to nothing. Rudy York is coming home, back of Tommy Henrik. He's being congratulated by Joe Gordon. The American League leads three to nothing. And Rudy York, who is a notorious center field and left center field and left field hitter, hit a home run straight away into right field for his first all-star run batted in, his 15th home run of the year. He has 14 through the regular season, and the score is three to nothing as Henrik scored ahead of him from third. Flash Gordon is up. He has an average of 347. A swing and a miss. Flash went up there ready to swing on the first one. The American leaguers are threatening to turn this into a first inning route. Two mighty home runs, one to left by Boudreaux, one to right with one on by Rudy York, each hitting his first round trip wallop in an all-star game. Two men out, none on, Gordon up. The count is one strike, Cooper pitches, there's a swing and a miss, and a chest high curveball outside, and the count is two strikes. Morton Cooper so far has been no puzzle for the American leaguers, but the game is young. With eight and two-thirds innings still to be played, it is anyone's ball game. Two men out in the top of the first, nobody on. Gordon has a mark of 347, bats right, waits, swings and misses for strike three. That's the first strikeout of the 10th All-Star game. But the American leaguers pounded Morton Cooper savagely in the first half of the first inning. They collected three runs on three very solid hits for a total of ten bases. There were no errors, and of course, there were no runners left on base. Now in the event you tuned in late on Mutual's exclusive play-by-play -play report of the 10th All-Star Game from the Polo Grounds in New York, the proceeds of which are to go into the Baseball Equipment Fund and to the Army and Navy Service Relief Societies. Here are the lineups again. For the American League, manager Lou Boudreau of the Cleveland Indians, shortstop. Tommy Henrik of the Yankees, right field. Ted Williams of Boston, left field. Joe DiMaggio of the Yankees, center field. Rudy York of Detroit, first base. Flash Gordon of New York, second base. Ken Keltner of Cleveland, third base. Bertie Tebbets of Detroit, catcher. And Spurgeon, Spud Chandler, whose record is 9-2, and two, a right-hander on the mound. For the National League, Jimmy Brown of the Cardinals, second base. Archie Vaughn of Brooklyn, third base. Pete Reiser of Brooklyn, center field. John Mize of the Giants, first base. Manager Mel Ott of the Giants in right field. Ducky Medwick of Brooklyn in left. Walker Cooper of the Cardinals, back of the plate. Eddie Miller of the Boston Braves at shortstop. And Morton Cooper of the St. Louis Cardinals on the mound. He already has been shelled savagely to the tune of three runs. The score is three to nothing in favor of the American Leaguers. Here comes Jimmy Brown, who is a switch batter. He will bat left-handed. With Spud Chandler on the mound, he has a batting average of 263, including one home run and 14 doubles. Here's the pitch. That ball hit him right in the small of the back, and he takes first. Jimmy Brown had no opportunity even to get out of the way of an inside curve ball that broke very sharply, hit him in the small of the back, and he becomes the first National League base runner in the All-Star Game of 1942. Archie Vaughn is up. Archie has a batting average of 270. He bats left-handed. One on, nobody out. Chandler pitches. Inside, ball one. Bill McKechnie is coaching at third base for the National Leaguers. Frankie Frisch of the Pittsburgh Pirates is coaching at first. One ball, no strikes. Here's the pitch. There's a ground ball that is hit to second baseman Gordon. Gordon to Boudreau. One out. Boudreau to York. Double play.
With a count, one ball. Archie Vaughn lashed a savage grounder that went straight as an arrow from a bow to Flash Gordon. Gordon wheeled through to Boudreaux, who made a magnificent pivot to throw to Rudy York, who made a good stretch to get Vaughn ahead of the relay. Two men out, nobody on. Pete Reeser, the Major League batting champion of the moment at least, with a batting average of 361. A left-hand batter, two men out and none on. It knocked him down. Ball one, close to the head. Pete went down, now he gets up, brushes the dirt off his trousers. Spud Chandler is scraping the dirt together on the mound to make more comfortable that pace of his that he takes towards the plate. He has gotten rid of two men. His teammate, Joe Gordon, started a twin kill. Here's the pitch. Low and inside for a second ball. The American Leaguers have a lead of three runs to nothing on the strength of a home run by Lou Boudreau and a home run by Rudy York after Tommy Henrik had doubled. Two balls, no strikes. There's a slowly topped ground ball that goes to Gordon. Gordon flips to York, and the side is retired. Chandler did not retire the side in 1-2-3 order, however. He hit Brown with a pitch. Vaughn smashed into a Gordon to Boudreau to York double play, and then Reeser hit an easy roller to Joe Gordon. Gordon came in fast and smothered it on a slow hop and threw to York for the out. No runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left in the last half of the first inning, and there is a little band music to celebrate the fact that the American Leaguers have been the first to score. They'll show no partiality through the course of the evening, however, because there'll be just as much in the way of celebration on the part of the National League fans here tonight. The National League, by the way, is the host of the evening. Artie Fletcher is coaching at third base. He's the celebrated Yankee coach, signal stealer, and third base coach par excellence, who has aided Joe McCarthy and his Yankees to so many world championships. Coaching at first base is Bucky Harris, the manager of the Washington Senators, the former boy wonder. The coaches for the National Leaguers are Bill McKechnie and Frankie Frisch. The respective managers, of course, are the two men who matched strategies and tactics in the World Series last year at Yankee Stadium and Ebbets Field, Leo Jarosher and Joe McCarthy. Defensively, the National Leaguers have Medwick in left, Reeser in center, Ott in right, an infield of Mize, Brown, Miller, and Vaughn, and the Cooper brothers of the battery. Ken Keltner of Cleveland is up. He has an average of 285, and he bats right. He opens the second inning for the American Leaguers. Cooper pitches. Ball one. The first pitch was just about hip high, and it missed the outside corner. The score, American Leaguers three, National Leaguers nothing. The outfield is a shade to the left. Third baseman Archie Vaughn is playing close to the bag. Miller is deep at short. Here's the pitch. There's a ground ball, slowly topped towards Miller, who charges it. Makes a quick throw to first baseman John Mize for the out. That was an easy chance. And the Boston Brave shortstop, who has gone through 39 errorless games and has come within 25 or 30 chances of Leo Jarosher's all-time National League defensive record, made an easy play. One man out, and here is Bertie Tebbets, the catcher of the Detroit Tigers. He has a batting average of 244. He has nine doubles so far this year. He is a straightaway hitter. They play him slightly to the left. A crossfire pitch is wide. Ball one. One man out in the first half of the second inning. The outfield slightly to the left. Miller playing back on the grass. Jimmy Brown, too, on the right side of second base is deep. And the third baseman and first baseman are playing fairly close. Right fielder Mel Ott is not deep. Cooper winds up. Delivers. Strike. Call. A sidearm fastball. The crowd likes the colorful way that Ballantyne has been calling them because his voice has penetrated to every nook and cranny of the historic polo grounds. One and one the count. One man out. Nobody on. The American League at bat in the first of the second with a three to nothing lead over their National League brethren. Here it is. A swing and a miss. And Tebbets very nearly lost his balance and sat right down into the dirt. One and two. If there is any one mark of distinction that Bertie wears more than any other, it is his aggressiveness. He is reminiscent of the great Mickey Cochran. He is a fire eater and he fights for what he believes to be the right. One and two. One man out. The pitch. Swing and a miss. Strike three. That is Cooper's second strikeout. He got Gordon to end the first half of the first inning. And here's Spud Chandler, the Yankee pitcher, coming up. He worked as recently as last Friday night when he defeated the Boston Red Sox in the opening tilt of that crucial three-game series at Fenway Park. The first five hits were doubles, two of them by Williams and two by Dorr, but thereafter he settled down to coast in with a five-to-three lead. The fact that the Yankees took two out of three from Boston in that series enabled them to stretch their American League lead to four games. Spud has a batting average of 147. Two men out and none on. A half swing. Call the ball when the pitch is wide. One ball, no strikes. Spud has a season's pitching record of 9-2. and two. 
He and his teammate Hank Baroy of the Yankees are tops in the American League, just as Larry French is in the National Loop. Cooper pitches. Ball two. That pitch was low and outside. Spud steps out of the batter's box. As pitchers hit, he's capable of pulling it a long way. The infield is back slightly on the left, and Mize is playing in just a few feet back of first base. Cooper gets his sign from his brother Walker. He delivers. Ball three, low. Chandler was well up front that time. He had his bat in bunt position, never used it. And the count is three and oh. Three balls and no strikes. The American leaguers are trying to make it seven out of ten in this all-star classic tonight. Cooper gets set. And it's a perfect strike. Chandler was set to take it, and he did. Not even an effort to swing. Three and one the count. The National Leaguers are in the home team's dugout to the right and just below us in the dugout occupied by the New York Yankees when they play in the Polo Grounds and World Series are the American Leaguers. There's a swing and a miss for strike two and then Chandler did go down on one knee and was quick to get back up again. Cooper had himself in a three and nothing hole. Then he pitched a good call strike and got Chandler on a clean swing and a miss. Three and two. Two men out and no one on. The wind up. The pitch. There goes a long drive to right center field. Center fielder Reeser is over, waiting. And he takes it, going away for the third and final out in the first half of the second inning. That is Pete's first chance. No runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left. At the end of an inning and a half, going into the last half of the second inning with the National Leaguers slated to come to the plate, the totals are American Leaguers, three runs, three hits, no errors. The National Leaguers, no runs, no hits, and no errors. We pause now for station identification. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. WGN, the voice of the people, Chicago. The last half of the second inning coming up with Big Johnny Mize, the New York Giant first baseman, his manager and right fielder, Mel Ott, and left fielder, Ducky Medwick of the Brooklyn Dodgers, slated the bat in that order. If you're one of our most recent listeners and tuned in late, in the very first inning, Boudreau led off with a home run on the second pitch to put the American League ahead one to nothing. Henrik doubled to right center, moved up on DiMaggio's infield out after Williams had flied out, and York hit a home run into the right field stands just inside the pole to make it three to nothing. Chandler faces Mize. It's a strike. A fast one right down the middle to Big John. He represents most of the giant power, the power the Cardinals lost in their trade. He has an average of 292 and 14 home runs. There's a foul ball way over to the right, up against one of the box seats, and there goes Frankie Frisch of Pittsburgh to recover it. Strike two. Spud Chandler of the Yankees and Bertie Tebbets of Detroit. That's the American League battery. In left field, Williams of Boston, DiMaggio and Henrik of the Yanks in center and right. The infield, York of Detroit, Gordon of New York, Boudreaux and Keltner of Cleveland at first, second, short, and third. The count is two strikes on Johnny Mize. Here's the pitch. Too close. John simply stepped back almost imperceptibly to get out of the way of it. The outfield is just a shade to the right. And center fielder DiMaggio is playing deep. Chandler winds up, delivers. A curveball missed the outside corner. John followed it with his eye until the last possible break. The count is two and two. The National Leaguers are trailing. No runs to three in the last half of the second inning. Spud Chandler of the Yankees and his American League teammates are off to a flying start as a result of that power that they have been talking so much about. The wind-up, the pitch, there goes a ground ball, hit towards Rudy York, York spears it, Chandler covers, takes it in time for a beautiful piece of teamwork. That was a fine play, both by York and Chandler, who was able to go all the way from the mound to first to cover in time for the out. Mellot is up, and this, of course, is the polo grounds in the shadow of Coogan's Bluff, and Little Mal is one of the most beloved baseball players John McGraw ever had. He succeeded to the mantle of the famous Little Napoleon. He bats left-handed, has a batting average of 269, which is well below par for him. He has 12 home runs, however, and 10 doubles this year. One out, none on. Strike called. Chandler threw a fairly slow curveball over the outside. It had a nice break, just about waist high. One strike, one man out. Nobody on. The American League ahead. Three to nothing. There goes a high foul ball, and it's going out of the field of play. Up on top of the press coop, and then it rolled down over the top. The count is strike two. That play made by Rudy York on Mize was great, but it would not have been possible had it not been for the quick reflex action of Spud Chandler, who went very quickly from the mound to first base to cover, a distance of about 65 feet. 
Two strikes. One man out, nobody on. The National Leaguers are striving desperately to get those three runs back. Chandler so far has been effective and he has had fine support. The outfield is straight away. Here's the pitch. Outside and high. One ball, two strikes. When Little Mel first reported to John McGraw down in the Louisiana training camp of the New York Giants, you may recall he was a catcher. But after one or two days back of the mound, back of the plate, McGraw decided to make him a fielder. Here's the pitch. Outside. Ball two, two and two. Mel still has that characteristic of his batting stance. He cocks that right foot well up into the air and lets go with it just as he swings with that lethal left-handed power of his. Two and two, one man out. Nobody on for the National Leaguers in the last half of the second. Spud Chandler gets his sign from Bertie Tebbets. He takes a deep windup. Pitches inside. That one very nearly hit Mel. Three and two. He had to spin back out of the way of it. Plate umpire Lee Ballantyne goes through his whisk room act. Now he puts the brush back into his pocket. He is trying to tell somebody in the dugout that that last was a foul ball and the count should be two and two. That's right. I assume that the ball nearly hit Mel, but it ticked his bat on the way by. Here's the pitch. Strike three, and he is called out. He stands there as if he does not believe it. It's a called third strike. A curveball that broke just about chest high. Apparently it caught the inside corner. And Mel stood there incredulously, finally went back to the dugout and made way for Ducky Medwick of Brooklyn. That is the first strikeout for Spud Chandler. And he crossed up Mel out with a superb curveball. Two men out, Medwick up with a batting average of 344. He's runner up to Reeser in the National League batting department. Here's the pitch. There's a ground ball hit to Rudy York. York takes it. There goes Chandler to cover quickly. He steps on the bag. Medwick is out. And that is a 1-2-3 inning. In two frames, Spud Chandler of the New York Yankees has faced only six of his National League brethren. Oddly enough, out of the three plays that have not involved a double play on the part of the American League defense, it has been York to Chandler twice, with Mize and Medwick being the victims. In two innings, the National Leaguers have no runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left. They have had only one base runner, and he was short live. Jimmy Brown was hit by a pitch in the first inning, but Vaughn whacked into a Gordon to Boudreaux to York double play. Morton Cooper is going to pitch in the first half of the third inning as well. And again, he will face Lou Boudreaux. That home run of Lou's must have climaxed a boyhood dream, because what red-blooded American youngster doesn't have some childlike vision that one day he will step up to the plate in an all-star game or a World Series classic, and boom one of the enemy pitches far away into the bleachers for four bases. It was the first run Lou had driven in in an all-star game. It was also his first home run. Rudy York's first home run was a freak as far as Rudy is concerned because he hit it as a left-hander might, just down the right field line, a well-timed blow that went into the stands. Boudreau has one hit for a total of four bases. Morton Cooper pitches. There goes a high fly ball to straight center field. Reeser is coming in fast. Second baseman Brown going out. Reeser takes it for the out. One man out, nobody on. Tommy Henrik comes up. Henrik got two bases on a ball that stopped rolling when it got out into short right center field. Both Reeser and Ott had to converge on it. Tommy collected his 18th double of the year, but 17 of them count in regulation American League games. One out and none on. He bats left. There goes a high pop-up. Jimmy Brown is running in to the right side of second base. He follows it, and he takes it for the second out. Morton Cooper has really buckled down. He has now retired six consecutive American League batters after that savage three-run explosion in the top of the first. Two men out and Ted Williams up. Ted lifted a high fly ball to left fielder Joe Medwick about 360 feet out his first time up with Henrik on second base. Henrik was stranded, moved to third, and then scored on York's homer. Ted gets set. Here it is. Strike. Called. That pitch was right through the heart of the plate. It split that 17-inch platter just below the buckle. And the count is strike one. Two men out. Ted has 18 home runs, 13 doubles, four triples this year, and has driven in 80 runs. Two men out and none on. Here's the pitch. There goes a drive safely into right field for a solid base hit. And the kid pulls up at first with a single. Hit number four for the American League. Joe DiMaggio comes up. 
Joe grounded out in the first inning to third baseman Archie Vaughn of the National Leaguers. The fact that a few boos greet him as he goes to the plate is really a tribute to his popularity because no player has ever really achieved greatness until some of the boys sit back and give him the old Bronx cheer. It's music to the ears of most of them. Two men out, Williams on first. DiMaggio, a right-hand batter, the outfield deep to the left. There's a high pop-up to the right. Back of the plate comes Walker Cooper waiting for it, and he takes it for the third out in the top of the third inning. A high foul fly on the first pitch with Williams breaking for second. No runs, one hit, no errors, one runner left. In the event you tuned in late, the American League's three runs came right off the reel. They exploded like gunpowder. Lou Boudreau took a ball. Then the next pitch was in there, and he promptly lost it in the left field stands at around the 400 mark. It was a tremendous wallop, and he put every ounce of his right-handed power behind it to drive in his first all-star game run and send the American leaguers away to a flying one to nothing start. Then Tommy Henrik doubled to right center. He held second as Medwick took Ted Williams' long fly ball in left center field. Henrik moved to third as Archie Vaughn threw out Joe DiMaggio, and Rudy York pulled a long right-handed home run just inside the right field stands the spot into which Mel Ott normally deposits those long round trippers of his. Willard Marshall is going to bat for Cooper. Mort Cooper. The first man up in the last half of the third inning will be Walker Cooper. His brother will not come to the plate. It will be Walker Cooper, Eddie Miller, and Will Marshall of the New York Giants. He is the sensational rookie outfielder of this year, whom the Giants purchased from one of the Southern clubs on a look basis. There's the long throw from catcher Bertie Tebbets down to sec ba second baseman Flash Gordon of the Yankees. Third baseman Ken Keltner is waiting for Spud Chandler to look up before he returns the pitch to him. In two innings, Spud has faced six men. He hit Brown in the back in the first inning to give the National Leaguers their only base runner. Now, with a more or less decisive three to nothing lead, he faces Walker Cooper, whose season's average is 284. Walker bats right. Foul tip into the dirt, out of the reach of Bertie Tebbets. Walker has four home runs so far this year, eight doubles and two triples. Oddly enough, he was the pitcher and Morton was the catcher when the Cooper brothers broke in. Mort decided he would infinitely prefer to throw at his brother. So today he is the outstanding pitcher of the National League with 11 victories and three defeats. One strike, no balls. None out and none on in the last of the third. Chandler delivers. There's a drive that goes savagely to Gordon's right into center field for a hit. The first National League hit of the night. It came on the second pitch. After a foul strike, Walker Cooper smashed a savage grounder about 15 feet to the right of Joe Gordon. And there is no longer a no-hitter in prospect for the American League twirler. Eddie Miller is up. Eddie has a batting average of 268. He's the shortstop of the Boston Braves, is having his greatest year. He has a record of 39 errorless games. His batting record includes four home runs, 19 doubles, and he's well up among the major league leaders in stolen bases. Walker Cooper on first, none out. Here's the pitch. There's a foul ball drifting back into the stands for a strike. One strike, no balls. Nobody out in the last half of the third inning. How long Spud Chandler is going to pitch remains to be seen. There has been no warm-up activity in the American League bullpen. But Johnny Vanderbeer and Bucky Walters have been warming up alternately. It now is Vanderbeer in the National League bullpen out in right field. One strike. Chandler stretches. Pitches. There's a ground foul to the left. And the count is strike two. That hit the box in which the venerable Connie Mack of the Philadelphia A's is seated. One of the greatest figures in baseball. Two strikes the count. Back of home plate crouches Bertie Tebbets of Detroit. The infield is slightly to the left. It's set up in a possible double play formation. And Spud Chandler is undoubtedly trying to keep the ball low on Eddie Miller to make him hit it into the dirt. Here's the pitch. Strike three. Miller went after a chest-high curve ball, missed it cleanly, and then he asked the plate umpire Lee Ballantfant to check it and look it over. And Ballantfant is going to throw it out. That is Chandler's second strikeout. And here is Willard Marshall of the New York Giants. He is one of the New York Giant outfielders. He has a batting average so far this season of 251. Miller was the first out in the last half of the third inning. He went down swinging. Walker Cooper is on first. And left-handed Will Marshall is batting for Morton Cooper, the St. Louis Cardinal pitcher who started for the National Leaguers. 
the American leaguers lead three to nothing. Here's the pitch by Chandler. Low and outside for a ball. Here is another first, by the way. Walker Cooper got the first National League hit. Willard Marshall is the first pinch hitter of the evening. Chandler stretches. Pitches. A slow ball is topped to the right of the mound. Chandler picks it up. Throws to Boudreau for a force out at second. The relay to first is not in time. It's a fielder's choice. Marshall grounded one right back to Chandler, who quickly went to his left to break it down. He wheeled and threw to shortstop Lou Boudreau to force Walker Cooper, but Marshall reached first base on the fielder's choice. Boudreau was unable to get out of the way of Walker Cooper, who came in spikes flying in an effort to make his relay in time for the twin kill. Two men out. Will Marshall of the Giants is on first base, and Jimmy Brown, the St. Louis Cardinal third baseman, and the second baseman in the All-Star Classic tonight is up. He was hit by a pitch in the first inning. He bats left-handed. In the dirt, ball one. Jimmy bats both left and right. But the fact that Spud Chandler throws from the right side makes Jimmy turn around on the left side. He is a switch hitter. One ball, no strikes. Two men out. Marshall on first. Chandler delivers. There's a ground ball hit right to Joe Gordon. Gordon bobbles it, recovers it, and throws to first for the out. And the first three innings are over. Gordon bobbled the ball, but recovered in plenty of time. No runs, one hit, no errors, one runner left. So here are the three inning totals. For the American Leaguers, three runs, four hits, and no errors. For the National Leaguers, no runs, one hit, and no errors. And now for the play-by-play -play report of the next three innings, here is Mel Allen of WOR New York. Hello, everybody. We're going to have a new pitcher for the National Leaguers as we get ready to go into the fourth inning of this 10th annual All-Star game. And it's going to be Johnny Vandermeer. Morton Cooper, who started for the National Leaguers, worked the first three innings, allowed four hits, issued no passes, struck out one man, and allowed three runs, all of which came in the first inning when manager Lou Budrow of the Cleveland Indians led off with a home run. Tommy Henrik followed with a double. And then after Cooper had retired Williams and DiMaggio, Rudy York hit a home run into the right field stand, scoring Henrik ahead of him to give the American Leaguers their three runs and their current 3 nothing lead as we prepare to go into the first half of the fourth inning. And Johnny Vandermeer has appeared in 15 games so far this season for the Cincinnati Reds. He's won eight and lost six. He has pitched 121 in one-third innings, during which time he has allowed 90 hits, walked 46 men, struck out 75. This is not Vandermeer's first appearance in an all-star game. Here's the announcement. Back in 1938, Johnny Vandermeer appeared in an all-star game and got credit for one of the three games which the National Leaguers have won from the American League teams. He pitched three innings in 1938 in the all-star game, allowed one hit, walked one, struck out one to get credit for the win. Incidentally, Dizzy Dean and Paul Derringer are the other two pitchers who boast wins over the American Leaguers. Deans came in 1936 in the fourth game of the All-Star Classic. Final score was 4-3. to three. Paul Derringer got credit for the win for the National League in 1940. That was the year the National Leaguers shut out the American Leaguers 4 to nothing. the only shutout game in the history of the All-Star Classic. Along with Derringer, Walters, White, French, and Hubble combined to hurl that shutout. Rudy York leads off for the American League as we go into the first half of the fourth inning with the American Leaguers leading three to nothing. York hit a home run in the first inning with Tommy Henrik aboard. Bats right-handed. Vandermeer into the windup. In comes the pitch. York takes a very high one way over the head of Morton Cooper. Had there been anyone on, it would have been a wild pitch. Ball one. A very high pitch way over the head of both York and Morton Cooper. Vandermeer goes to the Rosen bag. Get a better grip on that ball. Outfield plays York. Just a bit toward left and center and left, straight away and right. Vandermeer ready, into his windup. In comes the pitch to York. He takes a high one for ball two. Do nothing to count on York. On deck is Joe Gordon, then will come Kenny Keltner. Vandermeer looks in to get the sign for Morton Cooper. Art Fletcher is coaching at third base. Bucky Harris, manager of the Washington Senators, coaching at first. Vandermeer ready with a 2 nothing pitch to York. York swings and misses, strike one. Two and one to count on Rudy. The National League infield, Vaughn at third, Miller at short, Brown at second, Mize on first. In the outfield, Medwick in left, Reeser in center, Odd in right. Two balls, one strike on Rudy York, leading off of the American League, first half of the fourth inning. 
Vandermeer throws. York takes another one high, very high for ball three. We have a 3-1 count on the Detroit Tigers' first baseman. He turns around and looks at Walker Cooper, and umpire Lee Ballantan working back to the plate and sort of smiles at them. Vandermeer adjusts his cap, stands up on the hill, looks in now to get the sign from Walker Cooper. Taking his time. Eyes all set for the 3-1 pitch. York digs in. Cocks that bat up over his right shoulder. Here it is. He takes it, and it's in there for call strike two. So we have a full count on Rudy York. Three and two. Three to nothing the score in favor of the American League. First half of the fourth inning. Outfield back very deep for York. Archie Vaughn playing a deep third close to the third baseline. Mize a deep first guarding the first baseline. Here's the payoff pitch to York. Rudy swings and misses. Strike three. Strikeout number one for Johnny Vandermeer. And the second American leaguer to have struck out this evening. The first one being Joe Gordon in the first inning, whom Morton Cooper struck out. And here's Joe Gordon stepping in. Has a batting average on the season of 347. That's right-handed. Gordon's all-star batting average is 125. Up until tonight's game. Vandermeer throws. Gordon takes a slow pitch high for ball one. Outfield pulled over toward left and deep and center and left. Almost ready to win right. Claim for a full hitter primarily. Vandermeer taking his time. One out, nobody on base. Johnny ready to work. Throws. Gordon takes it high for ball two. Two nothing to count. On the Yankees second baseman, Joe Gordon. Joe steps out of the batter's box for a moment to get himself a little dirt in his hands. Now he moves back in hitting position. Has a look at Bucky Harris coaching it first with the hitter take sign of the 2 0 pitch. Vandermeer ready to throw it. Goes into his windup. Gordon set at the plate. Here it comes. Joe swings and misses. Strike one. Two and one the count. Gordon steps out of the batter's box now. Vandermeer goes back to the rosin bag. Crowd got a whale of a kick out of Joe Gordon's terrific cut at that pitch. Three to nothing is the score. Favor of the American League. First half of the fourth inning. Vandermeer rocks in the box as he goes into his windup. Here's his delivery. Gordon takes it. Strike two. It's called. Sharp curve over the outside corner. Let her high. So it's 2 2 on Joe Gordon. Once again, Vandermeer to the rosin bag. The umpires back to plate Lee Ballantant at first base. Ernie Stewart, Al Barlick on second. Bill McGowan at third. One away, nobody on. Two balls, two strikes on Joe Gordon. Vandermeer looking in to get the sign from Morton Cooper. Now he's ready to work. Gordon digs in, awaiting the pitch. In it comes. It's high. Ball three, and we have a full count on Gordon. Three and two. Joe reaches down, get a little dirt. Wipes it on his hands, looks over at the National League bench. Some of the boys give him a bit of a ride. Now he gets in, stands deep in the batter's box, in close to the plate, feet pretty close together, holds that bat down to the end of the handle. Vandermeer all set for the payoff pitch to Joe Gordon. Here it comes. Gordon takes it, and it's in there for call strike three. And so Johnny Vandermeer strikes out the first two many faces. Rudy York and Joe Gordon. And already buzzing in the minds of the fans here at the Polo Grounds tonight. That historic performance in an all-star game of Carl Hubble. Remember that. He struck out those five men in a row. Here is Kenny Keltner stepping up. Grounded out to short in the second inning. That's right-handed. First pitch is high outside for ball one. Keltner hitting at 299 on the season. He was hitting at an even 500 up until tonight's game in all-star competition. Knee slightly bent, holds that bat down at the end of the handle, extended in front of his body. Outfield pulled a little over toward left. Vandermeer all set. Keltner digs in. In comes the pitch. Keltner swings and lifts a pop-up. Out toward short. Eddie Miller under it, waiting for it to come down. Still waiting, and he makes the catch for the out. It went way up there. It took a long time to come down. And so Johnny Vandermeer gets a nice hand as he moves off the mound of the National League bench. No runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left on for the American Leaguers. In the fourth inning, and the score at the end of three and a half innings, three to nothing in favor of the American League. Now we're going to pause for station identification. This is WGN, the voice of the people, Chicago. Hello there once again, baseball fans. Mel Allen speaking to you from the polo grounds this evening. The Mutual Broadcasting System is bringing you exclusively the play-by-play description of the 10th Annual All-Star Game. Bob Elson of Chicago and Jimmy Britt of Boston alongside bring you this play-by-play description. The game tonight is being played for the benefit of Uncle Sam's Armed Forces, for the benefit of their 
Bat and Ball Fund, for the Army Emergency Relief Fund, and for the Navy Relief Society. The score is 3 to nothing in favor of the American League as we come into the last half of the fourth inning. The American Leaguer striking swiftly, a home run by Lou Budrow and one by Rudy York with Tom Henrik on who had doubled in the first inning, giving the American Leaguers their three runs. Here's Archie Vaughn leading off for the National League in the last half of the fourth. He hit into a double play in the first inning. He hit two home runs last year in the All-Star game in Detroit. Spud Chandler into the windup. In comes the pitch. Swung on. So ground ball hit out to first. York grabs it. Chandler running over first to throw. He steps on first just in time for the out ahead of Archie Vaughn. A very close play. Chandler's had quite a workout tonight in taking throws over to first from New York. That's the third time tonight that he has made the put out at first base. Johnny Mize and Joe Medwick in the second inning each grounded to York and Chandler covered on each play. One out. Here is Pete Reeser, the Brooklyn Dodgers stepping in, grounded out to Joe Gordon in the first inning. Bats left-handed. Has an average on the season of 361. Three to nothing favor the American League last half of the fourth. This year it's possible for the starting pitcher to go five innings, and it may be that Chandler will go that distance. We'll wait and see. First pitch in to Reeser. Little outside, ball one. On deck is Johnny Mize. Three to nothing favor the American League last half of the fourth. Chandler turns his back to the plate, looks out in the outfield, playing Reeser almost straight away. Little activity in the American League bullpen right now. Left-hander and the right-hander warming up. Chandler into the windup. In comes the pitch to Reeser. It's inside for ball two. Al Benton of the Detroit Tigers is throwing along with Cottonette Smith of the Chicago White Sox. Chandler throws. Reeser swings to the lines. One out. Gordon makes a great stop. Picks it up. Throws to first. And in time for the out, but then York drops the ball. And the decision is changed on the play, and safe at first is Pete Reeser. Joe Gordon went far to his right and back to second base, made a one-handed, glove-handed stop of Reeser's drive. Picked the ball up after he had momentarily booted it. Threw over to first, in time for the out, but York couldn't hold on to the ball. And the decision first was changed, and the official scorer has decided to give Pete Reeser credit for a base hit. A beautiful stop by Joe Gordon. And here is Johnny Mize stepping in. Mize grounded out York to Chandler, who covered in the first in the uh, second inning, his first time up. Mize bats left-handed. One out. Reeser on first. Chandler looks in to get the sign from Tebbets, takes a stretch. Looks over at first. Here's the pitch. Mize takes it over the inside corner for call strike one. Bill McKechnie, manager of the Cincinnati Reds, coaching at third base. Frankie Frisch at first base. Outfield playing Mize deep. Slightly toward right and center right. Almost straight away and left. Chandler ready. Reeser moves off first. The pitch to Mize. Mize swings and he misses. Strike two. Kenny Keltner at third base. Lou Budrow at shortstop. Joe Gordon at second. Rudy York on first. The American League infield. Bertie Tebbets is catching. In the outfield, it's Williams in left. DiMaggio in center. Joe DiMaggio. And Tommy Henrik in right field. Spud Chandler stands ahead of Mize. Frankie Frisch hollers down to the plate. To John B. Ready. Chandler ready to work. Looks over, throws. Mize swings and drives one going into deep right field. There goes Tommy Hendrick racing way back, going back to the bullpen and makes the catch for the out. And Pete Reeser, who was all the way down to second, has to hustle to get back to first. Johnny Mize drove one into deep right field. A drive good for more than 400 feet. But Tommy Hendrick raced way back to the National League bullpen, which is in deep right field to make the catch for the out. It was so far out that Pete Reeser was on first, had time to go all the way down to second base and come back to first after the catch. Two outs now. Had Mize been able to pull that one a little bit more, it would have been in the stands. Two outs, and here's Mal out stepping in. Took a third call strike in the second inning. Left-handed hitter, first pitch to him. Outside and low for ball one. Three to nothing to score in favor of the American League. Last half of the fourth inning. Two men away, Pete Reeser on first base. Defensive setup for Ott, almost the same as it was for Johnny Mize. Chandler blows on his pitching hand, bobs the ball around in his glove. Bertie Tebbets in the cuts, give him the sign. Chandler takes a stretch, Reeser leads off first, in comes the pitch to Ott. It sends the dirt and gets away from Bertie Tebbets. There goes Pete Reeser down to second. Tebbets chasing the ball, Reeser takes a wide turn, but ducks back in the second. And lining up in back of Kenny Keltner, who's there to cover third, is Chandler, Budrow, and Ted Williams. He had plenty of protection. Back of him on that play had uh, Tebbets elected to throw the ball down to third. 
The official scorer has called that a pass ball. Charge to Bertie Tebbets, enabling Pete Reeser to go down to second base, and that puts him in scoring position. Two balls, no strikes on Mallott. Hardy has a look at Bill McKechnie coaching at third for the hit or take sign of this 2 nothing pitch. 3 to nothing to the score, favor of the American League, last half of the fourth. And that's the first National Leaguer to have reached second base so far in the ball game. Chandler taking his time. Mallott stepping in there to hit. Chandler ready. Takes a stretch. Look back at second. Throws. Over the inside corner for call. Strike one on Adi. Two and one. Three nothing to score. Play with the American League. It's the last half of the fourth inning. Two men out. Pete Reeser on second base. Out the batter with Joe Medrick on deck. Chandler takes a long, slow stretch. Throws. Out swings and drives it foul right at the plate. Strike two. 2-2 two, two the count. Bertie Tebbets picks the ball up. Hands it to Lee Ballenfant. Lee rubs the cover up a little bit and hands it back to Tebbets, who in turn tosses it out to Spud Chandler. Little activity still going on in the American League bullpen. Al Benton, a right-hander, and Ed Smith, a left-hander. Warming up. Benton of the Tigers, Smith of the White Sox. 2-2 two, two the count on Mallott. Chandler taking his time. Now he's ready. Into his stretch. Reeser leads off second. Here's the pitch to Ott. Mel swings and drives one, but curving foul. It's going foul up into the upper deck in right field. He pulled that one a little bit too much. Pulled it foul up over the scoreboard in right field and into the upper deck. So the count remains. Two balls, two strikes. Mel's been playing these polo grounds for many a year. Knows all of its little tricks. And many a ball he's pulled into those right field stands. He's hit 12 home runs on the season. Chandler ready. Here it is. Ott moves away from an inside pitch for ball three. So we have a full count on the giant skipper. Mel Ott steps out of the batter's box, gets a little dirt on his hands. Chandler turns his back to the plate, looks around the outfield once again. Pete Reeser standing just a few feet off second. Lou Budrow deep short. Budrow starts moving in back of Reeser, trying to make Reeser duck back into second. Reeser doesn't pay him any attention. Chandler ready for the payoff pitch to Mallott. Here it is. Ott swings, sends a bounder out to second. Joe Gordon takes it on two hops, throws over to Rudy York in time for the out. And that's all for the National League in the last half of the fourth inning. No runs, one hit, no American League errors, one man left on base. And the score at the end of four innings, three to nothing in favor of the American League. As we go into the fifth inning, it'll be Bertie Tebbets, Spud Chandler, and Lou Budrow scheduled to hit in that order unless we have a pinch hitter possibly for Chandler. Activity still taking place in the American League bullpen, and that's all for Chandler. He just took his jacket, threw it over his arm, and is trotting out to the clubhouse. Listen to the applause. Spud Chandler who started the game for the American League, thus worked four innings, allowed only two hits, issued no passes, and struck out two men. And should the American Leaguers maintain their current advantage, the victory will be credited to Spud Chandler in all probability. Bertie Tebbets will lead off for the American League as we go into the first half of the fifth inning. Tebbets struck out in the second inning in his only appearance at the plate thus far. This is Bertie's first appearance in an all-star game. Bill Dickey, who was scheduled to catch for the American Leaguers, came up with the lame shoulder and was unable to participate. Tebbets digs in, right-handed batter. Outfield pulled over toward left. Johnny Vandermeer, left-hander, doing the pitching now for the National League. Morton Cooper worked the first three innings. Vandermeer into the windup, first pitch to Tebbets. Over the inside corner for call, strike one. Art Fletcher coaching at third. New York Yankee coach. Bucky Harris, manager of the Washington Centers, coaching at first base. Bob Johnson of the Philadelphia Athletics is going to bat for Spud Chandler. He's on deck. Vandermeer pitches. Tebbets takes it. Inside. Ball one. Almost had the inside corner, but not quite. Walker Cooper still doing the catching for the National League. National League wearing home uniforms. They're the home team today. One and one the count now on Bertie Tebbets. 
Three to nothing to score. Favor the American League. It's the first half of the fifth inning. Johnny Vandermeer, the left-hander, ready, throws. Tebbit swings and fouls it off. Over the National League dugout, up into the upper deck. Strike two. One ball, two strikes. Walker Cooper rubbing up the cover of the new ball. He just got from umpire Lee Ballantant. Tosses it out to Johnny Vandermeer. If custom is followed, as in past all-star games, we will have a shift in the umpires at the end of this half inning. One ball, two strikes on Vandermeer, on uh, Bertie Tebbets. Johnny Vandermeer doing the pitching. All set to work on Tebbets. Into his windup. In comes the pitch. Tebbets takes a high one for ball two. Two to the count on Bertie. Al Benton is throwing in the bullpen for the American Leaguers and very likely will take to the mound as we come into the last half of the fifth inning. Time call for a moment. Tebbett stepped out of the batter's box. Now he moves back in hitting position. Two balls, two strikes to count. In comes the pitch. Tebbett takes it. It's high for ball three. Three and two to count. Bucky Harris coaching at first points to first base as Tebbett looks down to him. In other words, meaning watch this one carefully. Get on base. Make it be in there, in other words. Vandermeer standing on the hill looking in to get the sign from Walker Cooper. Swoops down low into his windup. In comes the pitch. Tebbets lifts a high pop-up curving foul back to first. Johnny Mize going over and Walker Cooper Mize under it and makes the catch for the out. Tebbets fouls out to Johnny Mize. And here's Bob Johnson of the Philadelphia Athletics coming up to bat for Spud Chandler. Johnson has an average on the season of 278. Here's the announcement. Johnson was on the all-star squad for the American League in 1935 and 1938. Has been at bat five times and has failed to hit. Vandermeer into the windup and the first pitch to Johnson's. He starts to swing, checks it, but it's in there anyway for call strike one. Outfield plays him toward left and center and left, almost right away and right. Johnson holds that bat down with him. The handle cocks it high up over his right shoulder. Stands in fairly close to the plate. Feet slightly spread. Vandermeer set the throw. Does. Johnson swings and lines one out in the left field for a base hit. Joe Medrick goes over to field it. There's Johnson taking his turn. Medrick throws in to Jimmy Brown at second. The ball cut off by Eddie Miller. It's short. And on it first is Bob Johnson with a single to left. And that's his first hit in an all-star game. His sixth time at bat. And that, for the American Leaguers, is their fifth hit of the evening. Four of them off Morton Cooper, the first one off Johnny Vandermeer. Claude Passo is throwing in the bullpen for the National Leaguers. Passo, a right-hander. Manager Lou Bud drove the Cleveland Indians. Steps in, a right-handed batter, hit a home run in the first inning. Fly to Reeser and center in the third. That one hit and two times the bat so far tonight. Stretched by Vandermeer. I look over at first, in comes the pitch. Bud drove, takes it. A little low, ball one. Three to nothing the score favor the American League. It's the first half of the fifth inning. Outfield shaded toward left for Budrow in center and left, straight away and right. Eddie Miller in about three or four paces at short. Same for Jimmy Brown at second in double play position. Vandermeer takes the stretch. In it comes. Pitch is swung on and fouled off by Lou Budrow, who took a couple of steps forward in the batter's box trying to drive the ball behind the runner into right field. One and one the count on Lou. Tom Henrik is on deck. One out. Bob Johnson on first base. Vandermeer just gone to the Rosenbag. Now steps back onto the hill. Looks in to get the sign from Morton Cooper. Takes his stretch. Johnson leads off first. Mize on the bag with him. Here it is. Pitch is swung on. Fouled off high to the right of the plate. Up over the roof and out of the ballpark. One ball, two strikes still to count on Lou Budrow. A youthful skipper of the Cleveland Indians doing a grand job for his American League entry. One and two on Lou. Johnny Vandermeer is taking his time. Guys all set to go. Johnny Myers on the bag at first with Bob Johnson who takes a short lead. Vandermeer ready, takes a stretch. Looks over at first and throws. Budrow swings, sends one right back to the mound. Vandermeer takes it, throws to Eddie Miller who falls down to the ground but holds on to the ball. Keeps his foot on the bag in time for the out. Jimmy Brown was over two. And Bob Johnson sliding in upset Jimmy Brown, but Eddie Miller had his foot on the bag as he fell, taking the throw from Vandermeer for the force play on Bob Johnson at second. 
No chance for a throw to first, attempting to double up Lou Budro. So there are two outs. Budro on first base. And the batter, Tommy Henrik, who doubled in the first inning, scored a moment later ahead of Rudy York's home run to the right field stands. Henrik popped out to Jimmy Brown at second base in the third inning. Hits left-handed, stretched by Vandermeer. Budro has a leadoff first. In comes the pitch to Henrik. He swings, and he misses. Strike one. He tried to check his swing, but couldn't. Went around. Ted Williams is on deck. He'll hit next if Tommy Henrik gets on. This is Henrik's first appearance in an all-star game. Budrow moving off first. Vandermeer takes a stretch, looks at the runner, throws to Henrik, and it's in there for call strike two. A nice curve over the inside corner, belt high. And so Vandermeer stands ahead of the hitter. 0-2, no balls, two strikes. 3-0 the score in favor of the American League. It's the first half of the fifth inning of this 10th annual All-Star Classic. Vandermeer okays the sign. Budrow moves way off first. Johnny throws in to Henrik, who swings and lifts a foul up over our mutual booth up into the upper deck to the left of home plate. Count remains, no balls, two strikes. Henrik chokes the bat just about an inch. Stands deep in the batter's box, fairly close to the plate. Drives a long ball. Good full hitter. Here it is. Henrik takes it. It's high for ball one. Tommy can also punch him to left field pretty well since the outfield plays him straight away. Johnny Mize on it first with Budrow. Two men out. One ball, two strikes on Tommy Henrik, the batter. Vandermeer ready to work now. Takes his stretch. Budrow moving off first. Here it is. Henrik swings and he misses. The ball is dropped by Cooper, but he picks it up. Tags out Tommy Henrik. Strikeout number three for Johnny Vandermeer. And that's all for the American League in the first half of the fifth inning. No runs. One hit. No errors for the National Leaguers. One man left on. And the score at the end of four and one half innings, three to nothing in favor of the American League. And sudden onslaught by the American Leaguers in the first inning, which saw Lou Budrow lead off with a home run. Tom Henrik double and Udy, Rudy York to follow with a home run has given the American Leaguers their three nothing lead. And so as we come into the last half of the fifth inning, we're going to have a new pitcher for the American Leaguers. Bud Chandler worked the first four innings, allowed only two hits in blanking the National League. It's going to be Big Al Benton of the Detroit Tigers. Benton has been in 17 games so far this season for Dell Baker. He's won six and lost five. Has pitched 129 in two-thirds innings. Has allowed 111 hits. Walked 40, struck out 58. And we're going to have a change in umpires, as we indicated to you a moment ago. That seems to be the tradition in all-star games. We we'll watch and see just what the uh, lineup is going to be in the way of umpires as we get ready for more action here in the last half of the fifth. The announcement over the public address system was concerning the coming into the game of Al Benton. Bill McGowan is going to work back to the plate now, and Lee Ballantan is going to move down to third base. Al Barlick has uh, moved over to first base, and Ernie Stewart of the American League will umpire at second base. So there's the new alignment of umpires. Lee Ballantan of the National League, who started back to the plate and worked the first four and a half innings, has gone down to third. Bill McGowan of the American League, who was at third, has come in back to the plate. Al Barlick, who started umpiring at second base of the National League, has moved over to first. And Ernie Stewart of the American League, who was umpiring at first, has moved over to second. Joe Medrick leads off for the National League as we come into the last half of the fifth inning. He'll be followed by Walker Cooper and then Eddie Miller. Medrick bats right-handed. Grounded out, York to Chandler, who covered in the second inning. Benton into the windup, throws. First pitch is high for ball one. Three to nothing, favor of the American League. It's the last half of the fifth inning. Bill McKechnie of Cincinnati still coaching at third. Frankie Frisch of Pittsburgh at first. Benton throws, Medwick takes it. Strike one call, a fastball, let her hide. One and one to count on Joe. Playing great ball for the Brooklyn Dodgers this year. Benton looks in to get the sign from Bertie Tebbets. Detroit battery right now. Benton ready, throws. Medwick swings and fouls it off. Back to the plate, high, up over the roof, and out of the ballpark. One ball, two strikes on Joe Medwick. Al Benton has a new ball. 
and ready to work with it. Ebbets into the crotch to give Al the sign. Great big fellow. Andrews wind up, throws, Medwick ducks under a high pitch for ball two. Ducky ducked under that one. 2-2 the count on Medwick. Joe stands in close to the plate. Benton ready, throws overhand. There's a pitch swung on, and Keltner comes up with a great one hand to stop a throw to York in time for the out. Medwick drove one, which appeared headed between Keltner and Budgrove, but Keltner went to his left, came up with a one handed, glove handed pickup of his vicious bounder, and then threw over to York in time to retire Medwick and rob him of base hit. Here's Walker Cooper stepping in. Cardinal catcher single to right in the third inning for the first National League hit of the night. They've only had two. Bats right handed. Al Benton ready for the first pitch. Here it is. High inside. Ball one. Three to nothing to score. Play for the American League. It's the last half of the fifth inning. Eddie Miller is on deck. Walker Cooper ready. Here it is. He doesn't mean to swing on that one, but does. The ball rolls down the third baseline. Tepich picks it up, throws over to first. In time for the out on a very nice play. Walker Cooper meant to check his swing. Couldn't the ball hit the bat and rolled down the third baseline. Tebbets raced out, grabbed it, wheeled around, threw over to York in time to retire Cooper for the second out. And so there have been two swell defensive plays on the part of the American League here in the last half of the fifth inning to retire the first two men. Up now is Eddie Miller of the Boston Braves who struck out in the third inning, up for his second time, bats right-handed. Al Benton rocks in the box, throws. Miller swings, hits, it, hits this one, past the mound, out to short. Budrow up with it. There's a throw to York in time for the out. And so that's all for the National League in the last half of the fifth inning. Out in order. No runs, no hits, no errors. Nobody left on base. And at the end of five innings of play, the score remains 3 to nothing in favor of the American League. Going into the first half of the sixth inning, we'll have Ted Williams, Joe DiMaggio, and Rudy York coming up in that order for the American League. Bill McKechnie, manager of the Cincinnati Reds, stops at the plate to talk to Bill McGowan for a moment. Ted Williams, who has a couple of bats, swinging them from shoulder to shoulder, kids around with Bill McKechnie as he moves over now to the National League bench. Art Fletcher, who's coaching a third for the American League, goes down to talk to Lee Ballenfant back at third base, while Johnny Vandermeer tosses a few in from the mound. For those of you who might have tuned in late and are wondering how the American League achieved their 3-0 advantage, We'll repeat that Lou Bundro, in the first inning, leadoff man for the American League, drove one up into the left field stands for a home run. Morton Cooper was pitching at the time. Tommy Hendrick followed with a double to right, and then after Cooper had retired, Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio, Rudy York drove one into the right field stands for a home run, scoring Hendrick ahead of him. That's been all of the offensive fireworks so far in this game. Since that time, it's been quite a pitching duel. Morton Cooper worked the first three innings, allowed four hits, issued no passes, struck out one, gave up three runs. Johnny Vandermeer came in in the fourth inning and has been pitching ever since. Struck out three men and has allowed only one hit. Ted Williams steps in. He flied to Medwick in left field in the first inning, single to right in the third. He's had one hit and two times at bat tonight. Vandermeer goes into the windup. Here's the first pitch to Williams. Ted takes it. It's in there for a call strike. Started to swing, checked his throw, and fell away from the plate. 1 1 the count on Ted. Outfield pulled a little bit toward right for him. Vandermeer looks in to get the sign from Walker Cooper. Swoops down low as he starts into his windup. Whips the left arm around. Williams takes a change of pace pitch high for ball one. 1 and 1 the count. Joe DiMaggio on deck down on one knee to the left of the plate watching the action. Vandermeer is working very slowly. No hurry. Nice set for the 1-1 pitch into Williams. Williams ready. Here it is. Williams swings and misses. Strike two. One ball, two strikes on Ted. Fans get a big kick out of seeing fellows like Williams, DiMaggio, and other sluggers swing and miss. Vandermeer stands a bit ahead of Williams. One ball, two strikes. He's ready to work. Here it comes. Low outside for ball two. Two to the count on Williams. Don't forget the... Second All-Star game to be played at Cleveland tomorrow night. Broadcast of which will come to you exclusively over the Mutual Network. 2-2 two, two the count now on Ted Williams. Vandermeer taking his time, mops his brow. 
Looks in to get the sign from Cooper. Williams stands in that plate. Swing the bat around. Vandermeer ready to work. Here it is. Williams moves away from a high inside pitch for ball three. So we have a full count on Ted, three and two. And Vandermeer has gotten into this situation a number of hitters since he's been in the ball game. Three, two situations. He hasn't suffered too much from it as yet, though. All set for the payoff pitch to Williams. Ted digs in. Vandermeer throws. Williams swings and drives a fly ball out into center field. Pete Reeser going back deep over toward right center. Under it waiting, and he makes the catch for the out. One away for the American League. First half of the sixth inning. Three to nothing. The score favor the American League. And here is Joe DiMaggio, the Yankee Clipper, who grounded out to Archie Vaughn at third in the first inning and fouled out to walk Cooper back to the plate in the third. Joe has had four hits and 27 times at bat in all-star competition, including one double and one home run. Vandermeer's first pitch to Joe. He swings and he misses. Strike one. He swung hard. This is the seventh all-star game for DiMaggio. One out, nobody on. DiMaggio the hitter, Rudy York on deck. Vandermeer ready. Here's the pitch. DiMaggio takes it inside. Ball one, fast pitch. Almost got the inside corner, but not quite. One and one the count on Joe. Stands that plate with the bat cocked up over his right shoulder. Wide open stance. Feet spread very wide. Outfield pulled way over toward left and deep. Vandermeer throws. DiMaggio swings and drives this one on the ground. Off the glove of Johnny Mize. Out into right field. The ball deflects. Now out comes in to field it. DiMaggio holds on to first and is credited with a base hit. His fifth in all-star competition. It was a vicious bounder to the right of Johnny Mize. He got his glove on it, but couldn't hold on to it. Bounced off his glove in a short right for a single. That's the sixth hit for the American Leaguers. Four of them off Morton Cooper, who worked the first three innings. Second off Johnny Vandermeer, who came in on the fourth and is now working his third inning. Up at the plate steps Rudy York, who hit a home run in the first inning with Tommy Henrik aboard and then struck out in the fourth inning, first time Vandermeer pitched against him. York struck his home run off Morton Cooper. Vandermeer is taking his time out back of the hill, looking around at the outfield, hitching up his trousers. York digs in, stands deep in the batter's box, in close to the plate, outfield shaded toward the left. Joe DiMaggio takes the lead off first. Johnny Myers on the bag. Vandermeer into the stretch. One out. Look at the runner. Here's the pitch to York. He takes it and it's in there for a call strike. Went into a bunting motion that brought Archie Vaughn racing in from third. Eddie Miller at short walks over near second, hollers something over to Jimmy Brown to get the signal straight. Double play combination. DiMaggio moves off first again. Vandermeer into the stretch. York digs into the plate. Vandermeer throws. York swings and sends a ground ball down to Vaughn. Vaughn over to Jimmy Brown, who drops the ball. And all hands are safe. Rudy York grounded to Archie Vaughn, who threw over to Jimmy Brown. And Jimmy Brown dropped the ball. And Sonera charged to the Cardinals' second baseman, enabling Joe DiMaggio to go safe at second. And York is safe at first, of course, on the fielder's choice, which resulted in error. So the American Leaguers are threatening once again. Runners on first and second. One out. Three to nothing to score. It's the first half of the sixth inning. And the batter is Joe Gordon, who struck out in the first inning. Took a third call strike in the fourth. In other words, he struck out twice in two appearances. DiMaggio leads off second. Rudy York moves off first. Vandermeer takes the stretch, looks back at second, then throws. Gordon swings and misses. Strike one. He swung hard. Outfield over toward left for Gordon and deep. It's Medwick in left, Reeser in center, Ott in right. The only changes we've had in the starting lineups have been in the uh, department of pitching. In the infield, it's Vaughn at third, Miller at short, Brown on second, Mize on first. Vandermeer throws high. Ball one to Gordon. One and one to count. Kenny Keltner's on deck. One out. Three to nothing. Favor the American League. It's the first half of the sixth inning. Joe DiMaggio on second base. Rudy York on first base. Johnny Mize playing a deep first. Not on the bag at all with York, who has a big lead off first. Slipping into second base was Eddie Miller trying to draw a throw from Vandermeer. But Vandermeer did not throw down. Joe DiMaggio ducked back into the bag. Miller goes back to a normal short position. Vandermeer takes a stretch. Look back at second. Here's the pitch to Gordon. Joe takes it. It's high for ball two. Two and one the count on Gordon. 
Flash steps out of the batter's box, gets a handful of dirt. Looks around at Art Fletcher coaching at third. And moves back in hitting position. Bucky Harris coaching at first. Is watching first base for Rudy York, who moves way off the bag. Johnny Myers playing at deep first. Vandermeer ready. Here's the pitch to Gordon. Joe swings and misses. Strike two. Two to the count on Gordon. Struck out twice already. In his two previous appearances. There's no activity in either bullpen right now. Since the first inning, this game has settled down into a real pitching duel. This has been the first real offensive threat since the first inning. In which the American Leaguers got all three runs. Vandermeer ready. 2-2 pitch to Gordon. Joe swings and misses. The ball is dropped by Cooper. But, of course, uh, Gordon doesn't run at all. And that's the third time in a row that Gordon has struck out. And that's the fourth strikeout for Johnny Vandermeer. Two outs. And here is Kenny Keltner stepping in. He grounded out to Eddie Miller in the second inning and popped out to Miller at short in the fourth inning. And Joe Gordon, who's been burning up the American League all season, strikes out. All three times he's been at the plate so far tonight. Vandermeer bearing down, trying to get out of the situation. DiMaggio on second. York on first. Runners lead off. Two down. First half of the sixth inning. Kelton the batter. Right-handed hitter. First pitch to him. He swings and misses. Strike one. On deck is Bertie Tebbets. He'll hit next if Keltner gets on. Cleveland third baseman stands up at that plate. Deep in the batter's box. In close to the plate. Knee slightly bent, holds that bat down on the end of the handle and straight up and down in front of his body. Vandermeer throws, Keltner takes it high for ball one. One and one the count. Three to nothing the score. Favor the American League. First half, the sixth inning. DiMaggio goes back to second, York to first. Now runners lead off their respective bases. DiMaggio comes way off second, York way off first. Vandermeer into the stretch. Keltner sets the plate. Here it is. Keltner swings and lifts a high pop up out toward the mound. Running in is Archie Vaughn near the mound, waving everybody away, and he makes the catch for the out. And Johnny Vandermeer pitched himself out of that one. And so for the American League in the first half of the sixth inning. No runs. One hit. Listen to the hand for Vandermeer. For the American League in the first half of the sixth inning, no runs, one hit, one error for the National League. Two men left on base. And that error, charged to Jimmy Brown, is the first error of the game. And now while we're waiting for the National League to come to bat in the last half of the sixth inning, let's pause for station identification. This... WGN, the voice of the people, Chicago. This is Mel Allen speaking to you once again from the polo grounds as we come into the last half of the sixth inning. Danny Litweiler is going to come in to pinch hit. He bats right-handed. Al Benton doing the pitching for the Detroit Tigers. Working for the American League right now. Throws. Litweiler swings and lines one out into right field. Gordon goes over. Can't get it. Makes a valiant try, but the ball drops into right field safely for a base hit. Danny Litweiler, batting for Vandermeer, lines a single to right field in his first appearance at the plate and his first appearance as a member of the National League All-Star team. That's only the third hit of the evening for the National League. First two hits having come off Spud Chandler, who worked the first four innings. Up now is Jimmy Brown, switch hitter, batting left-handed against the right-handed pitching of Al Benton. He was hit by a pitched ball in the first inning, grounded out to Gordon in the third. Benton takes the stretch, throws. Brown swings and lines this one foul, back to third for strike one. Joe Gordon came very close to coming up with one of those typical Gordon plays. Raced far to his left and leaped up in the air, trying to get the while his line drive. But couldn't do it. Dropped safely into right field for a hit. It's 3 to nothing. favor the American League. Last half of the sixth, the National League fans are starting that rhythmic chant calling for a rally. Benton takes the stretch. Here's the pitch to Jimmy Brown. He swings and lines another one foul. Back to third base for strike two. Bill McKechnie stepping things up, coaching at third base, manager of the Cincinnati Reds, and Frankie Frisch, manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates, is coaching at first. Both boys aiding and abetting Leo DeRocher, skipper of the Brooklyn Dodgers, who this year is piloting the National League entry into this 10th All-Star game. 
Benton ready, throws, Brown swings and sends one over the mound, out over second, picked up by Budrow, steps on second, throws to York for a double play. Beautiful twin killing. Jimmy Brown hit this one over Benton's head, out over second base. Lou Budrow scampered over at the bag, picked the ball up, same time stepping on second, flipped over to Rudy York at first to complete the double play. That's the second double play the American Leaguers have come up with. Here is Archie Vaughn stepping in. Two outs now, nobody on base. It's the last half of the sixth inning. American League leading three to nothing. Archie Vaughn hit into the first double play in the first inning after Jimmy Brown was hit by a pitched ball. Vaughn hit to Gordon and threw to Budrow, who delivered over to York for the double play. Vaughn digs in. Bats left-handed. Benton into the windup. Here's the pitch. Vaughn takes it outside for ball one. Benton looks in to get the sign from Tebbets, working rapidly. Pitches. Vaughn takes a fast one low for ball two. Outfield pulled over toward right, slightly toward right and center right, almost straight away and left. Claude Passo throwing in the bullpen for the National Leaguers. Benton ready, pitches. Vaughn looks at one over the outside corner for a call strike. Plenty of activity in the American League bullpen, two pitchers warming up, one of whom is a left-hander, Cotton Ed Smith of the Chicago White Sox. Two balls, one strike on Archie Vaughn, two men out. Here it is. Vaughn takes it low inside for ball three. It's the last half of the sixth inning. The American League out in front by a score of three to nothing. All the damage having come in the first inning. Benton ready for the 3-1 pitch to Vaughn. Vaughn takes it and it's in there for call strike two. Vaughn started down toward first base. Turns around to argue with umpire Bill McGowan. Bill McKechnie raises a howl at third. But there's no argument. Frankie Frisch stands at first with his hands on his hips looking in with a bit of a scowled plate. Three and two the count now on Vaughn. Benton ready. Here's the payoff pitch. Vaughn takes it. And it's inside for ball four. And Vaughn walks. And here's Pete Reeser stepping up. That's the first pass issued by Benton and the first National Leaguer to have received a base on balls tonight. And as a matter of fact, that's the first walk in the ball game. Pete Reeser steps in. He grounded out to Gordon in the first inning. Had himself an infield hit in the fourth. That's left-handed. Hitting on the season at 361. Benton takes the stretch. Here it is. Reeser moves away from a low inside pitch. Ball one is into the dirt. Got away from Tebbets a couple of feet, but not far enough to permit Archie Vaughn risking the chance of going down to second base. Two men out now. Reeser the batter. Johnny Mai is on deck. Archie Vaughn on at first base. Benton takes his stretch. Here it is. Reeser swings in, foul tips it for strike one. He really took a terrific cut at that pitch. One and one the count on Petey. Keltner at third is playing way over toward short. Gordon the deep second on the edge of the outfield grass. Stretched by Benton. Here it is. Reeser swings and drives one out into center field. There goes Joe DiMaggio way back, way back, getting under it and making the catch for the out. A drive good for some 400 feet. And so that's all for the National League in the last half of the sixth inning. No runs, one hit, no American League errors, one man left on base. And so that brings us to the end of the sixth inning mark, where the American League leading three to nothing, getting their three runs in the first inning on a home run by Lou Budrow, a double by Henrik, and a home run by Rudy York. Totals at the end of six innings for the American League, three runs, six hits, no errors, four men left on, for the National League, no runs, three hits, one error, and three men left on base. Morton Cooper was the starting pitcher for the National League, worked the first three innings, allowed four hits, issued no passes, struck out one, allowed three runs. Johnny Vandermeer relieved him, worked the next three innings, during which time he allowed two hits, issued no passes, struck out four, and did not allow any runs. Bud Chandler was the starting pitcher for the American League, worked the first four innings, allowed two hits, issued no passes, struck out two, and allowed no runs. Al Benton has been in there since he relieved Chandler in the fifth inning, and uh, he's still in the ball game as yet, so we won't give you his record until he will depart from the ball game. So at the end of six innings, it's three to nothing in favor of the American League, and now taking over as we go into the seventh inning, and to describe the remainder of the ball game for you is Bob Elson 
who covers the games of the Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox for the Mutual Station in Chicago. Here he is, Bob Elson. Thank you very much, Mel Allen. Good evening, friends. We have quite a ball game on our hands here in this uh, number 10 game uh, in the All-Star Series, uh, which uh, this year, as you know, is being played here in the Polo Grounds in New York. And as we go into the first half of the seventh inning, the National League is sending in a brand new team. At third base, Elliott of Pittsburgh. At short, Reese of Brooklyn. At second, Herman of Brooklyn. At first, McCormick of the Reds. The catcher, Lombardi. The pitcher, Passaw. The outfield. Here come the announcements now on the changes. Fans, we're going to interrupt the public address system. I know it's kind of hard to listen to two people at once, but they're going to start this seventh inning, so I want to give it to you. Uh, Eno Slaughter is in the ball game of St. Louis in left field. Terry Moore in center field. Ott is staying in right field. The entire National League ball club has changed, and the first man to bat for the American League, there's a hand for Reese as he's announced, is going to be Bertie Tennis. He's been up twice. He struck out and he popped up. And here's Claude Passall, the Cubs, getting ready with the first pitch. And it's an attempted bunt. And he misses the ball for a strike. Passaw has had a very fine record this year. He's taken part in 16 ball games. He's won 12. He's lost 5. He's pitched 154 innings. And he's taken part in 14 complete games out of 16 efforts. He's had 45 strikeouts, by the way. Here's the next pitch to Bertie Tebbets. There's a swing and a miss, a curveball in around his knees, and it's two strikes. There's nobody on and nobody out here in the seventh. The American League leads three to nothing, but the National League is still within striking distance, and the National League partisans here in the Polo Grounds in New York are still hoping that the National League will, in, will unload some of that power and really get back in this ballgame. The American League is not out of reach. It's just three to nothing. Two strikes on Tebbets. Here comes the next pitch. It's a strike, and it's... He tried to back away from a pitch that was inside. It's a called strike. It looked at first as though it might have hit his bat, but the umpire says no, and Tebbets is out on strikes. So it is a strikeout for Passaw, and that is seven strikeouts in all tonight. There were two strikeouts for Cooper, four for Vandermeer, and one for Passaw. Vandermeer was really hot out there tonight. Now the next man to come up is Big Al Benton of Detroit. Big right-hander, a massive fellow with a number 19 in the back of his gray uniform. Claude Passaw of the Cubs out there in the center of the diamond. Here's the first pitch. He swings and hits a hopper down the third baseline. Elliott coming fast. There goes the peg. He's out. Elliott to McCormick, and there's two gone. Elliott, a reformed outfielder, by the way, has played great ball for Frankie Frisch's Pittsburgh Pirates. As Frankie said, well, the kid looks like he's been in there for years. Elliott's played bang-up ball at third base for Pittsburgh. Now that's two gone. We're back to the top of the batting order for the American League, and here's Lou Bedreau. He's been up three times. He hit a home run. He flied out, and he forced a runner the third time. So he's up for his fourth time, and there's a high fly ball to left field. Country Slaughter getting under this ball, going to his right. He should get it. It's very high, and he caught it to retire the side. And so, before the right-hand shoots of Claude Passaw, the American League goes down one, two, three in the first half of the seventh inning. Now there's a big roar from the crowd. The National League partisans are standing in the last half of the seventh. The National League, as you know, is the home team here tonight. The American League has the lead in this series of six games to three, and it's been a wonderful ball game tonight. And now we're going to see if there are any changes for the American League. Yes, there are going to be some changes. Let's see. No, the American League is going to stay pat. The American League is standing pat with Williams in left field, DiMaggio in center field, Henrik in right field. Keltner at third, Lou Boudreau at short, at second base, Joe Gordon, and at first base, Rudy York. The catcher is Bertie Tebbets, and the pitcher is Al Benton. Going into the last half of the seventh fans, the score here in New York in the 10th annual All-Star Game, the American League three, and the National League nothing. Two home runs in the first inning by the American League did the trick. Now here's Frank McCormick coming up for the first time. Johnny Mize, who he succeeded at first base, batted twice tonight. The first time he bounced out to the first baseman, and the second time he flied out to right field. And here is Frank McCormick coming up to the plate. He is a right-handed hitter. 
Frank McCormick batting 249 for the season. He's hit 10 home runs, and he's batted in 50 runs. Al Benton gets all set. Here it is. It's a strike. It's right across his knees. A very sharp curve. And this Benton has really got a curve, too. He's got one he can throw around the corner of a building. He gets all set again. Watch it now. Nobody on and nobody out. Here it is. It's a ball. It's too low that time. McCormick stepped up on the ball and let it go by, and it's low for a ball. National League trying to get a rally underway. They're still trailing by three runs here in New York. But as you know, a ball game is never over until the last man is out. There's a bouncing ball to short. Pedro coming into the ball. There goes the peg. He's out. Pedro to York, and there's one gone. Pedro moved in about five steps to come up with McCormick's hopper and to throw him out. Now the American Leaguers pepper that ball around the infield. There's one gone. Here's little Mel Ott. The grand little manager of the New York Giants and perhaps one of the best-liked ball players of all time. Not only by the fans, uh, those of you listening in who make up the baseball audience, but by the players, too. Mel is liked by everybody. Here he is up in there, a left-handed hitter. One gone and nobody out. There is a strike, a slow curve over the inside corner at the waist. The first time up, Ott struck out, and the second time, he bounced out to Gordon. National League batting in the last half of the seventh. They're trailing by three runs. Here it comes, a slow ball. It's just a bit outside, a ball. That pitch was around his waist, and it just missed the corner by an inch. Bill McKechnie coaching down here at third for the National League. Frankie Frisch, the old Fordham flash over there at first. Nobody on and one gone in the last half of the seventh. Here it is. There's a swing and a miss, and that was a typical Ott swing. Right foot up in the air. You wonder where he gets that power. That time he swung around hard and missed it. And so it is two strikes. Ball one and strike two on Little Mel. Benton has a sign from Bertie Tebbets. He's winding up. Here it comes. It's a ball. He just missed the corner that time with a pretty pitch. And the kind of a pitch that a batter with two, strike, two strikes on him might want to go after. But Mel, who's got a keen eye up there, didn't go for it. It's ball two and strike two for up. Here comes the pitch. It's a swing and a foul on the ground. Down here to our left. The American Leaguers talk it up out there in the infield. And the American League outfield is playing straight away. This fellow out is a kind of a batter. You have to play every place for him. You can't swing your outfield or swing your infield or swing anything. And they're playing him absolutely on the diamond straight away. The outfield and infield. But you're getting set again. Here comes the next one to Ott. He struck him out. He went for a fastball right across his knees. And he struck him out. Boy, that was a beauty that time. Very fast and right in around his knees, and he went down swinging. Well, that's three times that the National Leaguers have gone down via the strikeout route tonight. Here's the left-hand hitter up. It's Slaughter. Country Slaughter, the left fielder playing in left field, the regular right fielder for the St. Louis Cardinals. Slaughter's average is 284. He's hit four home runs. And he's had 22 runs batted in. The first pitch was a ball, knee high. Here comes the next pitch to Slaughter. He swings, hits a high hopper. It's going to drop behind the pitcher. Gordon making the play. He's safe. He beat it out for a hit. Fans, that was that kind of a high hopping ball. It hit in front of the pitcher's box, went high into the air, bounced behind him. The pitcher couldn't make the play. Gordon came in, grabbed that ball, and fired it with the same motion. But Slaughter had it beaten out for a hit. So the National League has another hit. And that is a total of four hits for the night. And it brings up big Ernie Lombardi, one of the grandest characters in baseball. Ernie Lombardi. Here's big Ernie, did some great work for Cincinnati for years. He's a hard worker. He's done some fine work this year for the Boston Braves. Great big lumbering sort of a fellow. He led the National League a few years ago. And you know the amazing thing about Lombardi is that a fellow with his weight, and he's so slow a foot that he could lead the league. It's all the more credit to his batting eye because Lombardi doesn't get any of those rollers or any of those kind of balls that the infielders knock down and be, he beats them out for hits. He can't do it. He's too slow. Every time he hits that ball for a hit, he's got to hit it on the beam. First pitch was wide. The outfield is playing him just a little bit over to the left. Here's the next pitch. Lom swings and misses. A sharp curve in across his knees, and it's one and one. Ernie Lombardi batting for the National League. There's a man on first, and there's two gone. The ball game is in the last half of the seventh. National League trailing by three runs. Benton getting set. Here's the next pitch. There's a wallop, but it's foul. Ernie Lombardi hit one up against the top of the roof down the left field line, but to the left side of the foul line, and it was a foul ball. Ernie gave it a ride, but foul, and now the catcher, Bertie Tebbets, is going out to talk to Benton. 
And they're standing halfway between the plate and the pitcher's box, just having a chat while Lombardi in his white uniform stands up there at the plate. National League trails by three. It's the American League three and the National nothing in the last half of the seventh at New York. Big Al Benton, second pitcher for the American League tonight, is on the mound. Gets all ready again. Here's the next one, and it's a ball. It broke outside knee high, and it's two and two. Ernie started to go for that pitch. It looked like it was going to be pretty good at first, but he let it go by. Two pitchers are in the bullpen, Euston and Smith for the American League. Ball two, strike two for Lombardi. Here it comes. It's a ball very far outside. There is no doubt about it. And it's ball three and strike two. So Ernie is on the verge of a walk. Next man to come up will be the Dodgers shortstop, Pee Wee Reese. Lamb is going to get a 3-2 pitch to swing at. Here it comes. There's ball four. It's low, and it puts two men on. Here's Reese coming up for the National League. Fans, that's the second walk of the night. That's the second walk. It puts a man on first and a man on second and brings up Reese with two gone. Reese of Brooklyn, who has just gone in at shortstop, is batting. And his average for the year is 230. He's hit one homer, and he has 20 runs batted in. Reese up with two men on and two out in the last half of the seventh. And the National League partisans are making some noise here in the polo ground. Here's the pitch, and Reese takes, and it's a strike. It's right across his knee. By the way, Mel was just telling me that Reese hits well here in the polo grounds. Mel, of course, sees all these games in New York. Well, the National League could really use a hit in this spot. They have two men on and two out. Here comes the next pitch, and it's very wide. They wasted a pitch that time, and Bertie Tebbets cocked his arm as though he was going to throw that ball to first, but he held it. And so it's one and one on Reese. Two men on and two out in the last half of the seventh as the National League fights hard here in New York to come from behind. Al Benton getting his sign out there again. Here's the next one. There is a ball. It missed the corner knee high, and it's ball two and strike one for Reese. Remember that tomorrow night, Mutual will bring you the big game from Cleveland in the big municipal stadium at 845. Here comes the next pitch. Reese swings, and there's a line drive, and the drove caught that ball going to his left. The throw caught that ball going to his left to retire the side. A very hard hit ball, fans. The throw, the shortstop, went to his left, and just near second base, he reached out and caught that ball above his knees. It was a well hit ball, and the throw made a nice play on it to retire the side. And so that National League threat is over, and it is no runs and one hit, and the ball game is going into the first half of the eighth. By the way, the Attendance tonight is in the neighborhood of 35,000. Secretary Brannick of the Giants sent up the figures, which are in the neighborhood of $100,000. The Treasury Department will announce the exact figures in a day or so. All the money from this ball game and all the money from the game tomorrow night, the first $100,000 will be used for the ball and bat fund, which is to provide baseballs and bats and gloves for all the camps in the United States. After that, all the rest of the money will go to the Navy and the Army Relief Fund. Fans, were at the end of seven innings here in New York City in the All-Star Game. The American League, three. The National League, nothing. And now we're going to pause briefly for station identification. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is WGN, the voice of the people, Chicago. Now, this is Bob Elson talking to you again from the Polo Grounds in New York. We're all set to go into the eighth inning of this ball game. Mutual Broadcasting System brings you exclusive coverage of one of America's outstanding sports classics, the All-Star Game. The first man to bat for the American League is Tommy Hendrick, a left-handed hitter. He's stepping up in there now. He's been up three times. He's had one hit, and he's facing pass offs. We start the eighth with the American League still out in front by a three-to-nothing score. The outfield is playing Hendrick just about normal maybe around just a step or two to the right there is a smash to right field the right fielder coming fast he dove for the ball and he got it a beautiful catch the right fielder Melot just made a diving catch of Henrik smash to right field listen to that hand baby was that a honey that was the fielding gem of the night as Melot raced in and made a diving catch of Tommy Henrik smash into right field and that really brought the crowd to its feet. That was a beautiful play to watch. 
He certainly robbed Tommy of a hit that time. Now here's the great Teddy Williams up. He's been up three times, and he's had one hit, a single to right field in the third inning. He's a left-handed batter. And you remember the setup last year in Detroit when he hit a home run off a pass saw to win the All-Star game. Ball, it's low. Broad pass saw, and I've talked to him many times since. About what type of pitch he threw to Williams that broke up that ball game. He said, Bob, all I know is I threw him a baseball and it broke up the game. Getting all set out there again. Here's the next one to Williams. Williams takes one, a change of pace pitch that's high and a little bit outside, and it's ball two. There's one out here in the first half of the eighth inning. Mellot just made a great diving catch of Henrik's drive to right field, and there's one gone. Nobody on for the American League. They lead three to nothing. Here comes the next pitch, and it's a ball. It missed the outside corner, knee high, and it's 3 0 now for Williams. Artie Fletcher is coaching here at third to our left. And down to our right is Stanley Harris, who won two pennants for Washington some years ago. He gets set again. Here's the next pitch, and Williams hits on the 3 0 count and hits a foul up on top of the stand. With a count 3 0, Williams swung and hit a foul up on top of the stands. New ball is tossed down to third base to Bob Elliott, the Pittsburgh third baseman who roughs it up and then tosses it back to the mound. The National League has made no runs and four hits. The American League has made three runs and six hits. Two of them home runs. Pass all set. Here's the next pitch and it's a strike right down the middle of beauty that time right across his knees. Ball three and strike two for Teddy Williams one of the greatest hitters in the game. Big fellow, big, tall, skinny boy, a free swinger, and boy, he can really slam that baseball. Here comes the next pitch, and there is a high fly ball to center field. Terry Moore is getting under the ball, moving in just a few feet. He's out, and there's two gone. Williams flies to Terry Moore. Now here's the great Joe DiMaggio. Every time Joe comes up, he gets a chorus of boos and applause. But just as Jimmy Britt said before, a ball player is never a great ball player until he hears both boos and applause. And no one can deny Joe DiMaggio's place in baseball as one of the greatest players in the game. Here's the first pitch to him, and there is a spike. He caught the outside corner, waist high. Teddy Williams smiled out at Passau as he came back down the first baseline toward the American League dugout. DiMaggio has been up three times. He's had one hit. The last time up, he drove a hit off of York's glove, and it rolled into right field. Pitcher's getting all set again. Here's the next pitch, and there's a swing, and there's a bouncing ball. It's a hit into left center field. The shortstop, Reese, went to his left to try to cut off that smash on the ground by DiMaggio, but he couldn't get it. It whizzed by him like a bullet, and the Yankee Clipper has two hits tonight. That makes a total of seven hits for the American League, and it brings up the first baseman, Rudy York. DiMaggio, by the way, is the only player in the game with two hits. Here's Rudy York, the big first baseman of the Tigers. Stepping into the batter's box, he's been up three times. He hit a home run into the right field stand the first time. The second time, he was a strikeout victim. And the second time, he was safe on an error by the second baseman, Brown. He hit a ball down the third baseman that should have been a double play ball, but Brownie, taking the throw from third, dropped it, and York was safe at first. Now he's up with a man on first base and two gone in the first half of the eighth. American League three, the National League nothing. Pass all getting set. Here it is. Hits the ball. It's high. Ball one. The outfield is playing York deep. He can really give that baseball a ride. Terry Moore in center field. Country Slaughter in left field. And in right field, it's Mellot of the Giants. Slaughter is a regular right fielder, but he's playing left field here in the game tonight, and he's one of the best outfielders in the game. Pass all getting a sign again. Here comes the next pitch to York. York swings. There's a high foul. It's off here to the right. The catcher flips off his mask. Lombardi coming back, but there's no play. It drops into the stands right beneath our mutual broadcasting booth, and it is a harmless foul. Well, remember, the winner tonight plays the service team and a great attraction tomorrow night in the big municipal stadium at Cleveland. Tomorrow night, Wait Hoyt, Jack Rainey, and I will bring you the ball game from Cleveland as another exclusive mutual presentation. York swings that big bat around. He has a big black four on the back of his gray uniform. For a big fella, he kind of crowds that plate. There's a man on first. It's DiMaggio. There's a ball. It backs him right out of the box, and it's ball two and strike one. Passaw, the Cubs, is the third pitcher for the National League tonight. Morton Cooper started, then Vandermeer, 
and then Passaw. All the American League runs were scored on Cooper. Two home runs and a double in the first inning. Here's the next pitch. York swings. There's a hopper down the third baseline. It may be fair. It may be foul. It's fair. There's the throw. And he's out in a very close play. Boy, was that a close play. He picked that ball up just in front of the bag in about a half an inch fair. Fired that ball to first base. And the runner was out by just a fraction of a step to retire the side. And so, fans, it is no runs and one hit in the first half of the eighth inning. The American League is going out onto the field. And the National League is coming up to try again to get back into this 10th annual All-Star game. They're trailing by three runs. There's Al Benton going out to the center of the diamond. And let's take a look around that American League team. Williams in left field, DiMaggio in center field, Henrik in right field, Keltner at third, Bedro at short, Gordon at second, York at first, Tebbets is catching, and Benton is pitching, and it looks like McCarthy is going all the way with this American League team. Mickey Owen, who's done some great work for Brooklyn this year, is going to bat for Passaw as we start the last half of the eighth. Well, it's been quite a ball game, and believe me, these fans have seen a ball game here tonight. Mutual hopes that wherever you're listening to this game across the country, that it's giving you a lot of enjoyment. It's one of the outstanding sports attractions of the year, the annual baseball all-star game. And this year, it's for a great cause. All this money goes to Army-Navy relief after $100,000 is taken out for the ball and bat fund to provide baseballs and bats and gloves for all the camps. Now here's Mickey Owen up. He's a right-handed batter. He's making his appearance in the lineup as a pinch hitter for Passaw. Benton gets set. There's a bunt down the third baseline. It's foul outside the line. Kenny Keltner runs in for the ball, picks it up, and the boys whip it around. Mickey Owen is a right-handed batter. He's, his present average is 291 for Brooklyn. He's had no home runs, and he has batted in 22 runs. He's had this year one of his greatest years. Here's a fellow who was the unfortunate victim of a play in the World Series last year, which Mutual brought to you exclusively. And uh, that play of the missed third strike will probably go down as history. But did it, uh, did it affect this fellow's career? It did not. It made him a better ball player. Ball, it's inside. All the more tribute to Mickey Owen. Nobody on and nobody out as the National League tries to get a rally going here in the last half of the eighth, and their chances are slipping away. Here comes the next pitch, and there's a ball. It's high outside, and it's ball two and strike one. National League has changed their entire team tonight. Manager Joe McCarthy of the American League with a three to nothing league has just stood pat. Al Benton is all set again. Here's the next one to Owen. Owen swings. There's a high fly ball going to toward right field. It may be a home run. It feels a home run for the field. Yes, sir, this National League team is still battling here in New York in this All-Star game. It's 3-1 to one now in favor of the American League. Mickey Owen just batted for Passaw, and as a good pinch hitter should, he not only came through with a hit, he hit one for the circuit. Now here's the leadoff man, Billy Herman, a right-handed hitter. There's a ball, it's wide. Billy Herman's average for the year is 248. He's hit one homer, and he's driven in 29 runs. American League is warming up two pitchers, and there's the first squawk tonight. The pitcher, Al Benton, didn't like that call, and he's very red-faced out there as he hollers at the umpire, Bill McGowan. Billy Herman waits for the next pitch. Watch it. Here it is. There's a swing and a foul. It's out of play. It's up into the stands, off there to the right, and it's a foul strike. So we have a count of one and one on Billy Herman with one run in, nobody on, nobody out. Last half of the eighth inning at New York, the American League three, and the National League one. And this is some ball game. Now he rocks his arms back and forth. He's getting set again. Here it is. There's a ball. It missed the corner by an inch. And not anymore either. They're really waiting. Benton out now. It's ball two and strike one for Billy Herman. He went in at second base in place of Jimmy Brown. Here comes the next pitch. And Herman hits a little hopper to the pitcher's right. He's up with the ball. There goes the peg. He's out. Pitcher to first. And there's one gone. So that brings up the third baseman, Bob Elliott of Pittsburgh. 
Here's Bob Elliott coming up for his first time in the ball game tonight. His average for the year is 286. He slammed out eight home runs, and he's driven in 53 runs. The last half of the eighth at New York. This ball game will end at 9.30, even if it isn't over, because of a practice blackout here in New York tonight. In other words, at 9.30, regardless of what the score is or what the conditions are, the game ends. Ball one to Elliott. Here's the next pitch. There's a spike. It's right across his knees. It's called very sharp curve ball. One out, a run in for the National League. It's three to one in favor of the American. Bob Elliott of Pittsburgh, a right-handed hitter, is up in there. Benton gets his sign. Here's the next pitch, and there's a line drive. It's a hit to right field. The first baseman, York, leaped up but couldn't get it, and it puts Elliott on first base. A sharp hit to right field for Elliott. That's six hits for the National League. And it brings up the center fielder, Terry Moore, one of the greatest outfielders in baseball, Terry Moore, the St. Louis Cardinals. Batting 271, he's hit two home runs, and he has 17 runs batted in. But when it comes to ball hawks, and when it comes to fielding his position, this fellow doesn't have to take a back seat for anybody. And on first, Terry Moore batting. Here's the pitch. There's a spike. It's called. It's right across his waist. One out, a man on for the National League. They're trailing 3-1 to one here in the last half of the eighth, and they're running up against the time deadline. Gets all ready again. Here's the next pitch. There's a swing and a miss as Terry Moore took a vicious cut at a knee-high curveball, and it's two strikes on Moore. Moore steps out of the batter's box, knocks the dirt off his cleats with his bat. He's up in there again, a red eight in the back of his white uniform. Here he is right below our mutual booth. We could almost drop our pencil on him. We're so close to the field of play. Al Benton, a big towering right-hander out there on the mound, is getting set again. Here it is. And there is a ball. It's over his head and just a, a fraction behind him. And it's ball one and strike two for Terry Moore. Next man to come up will be the first baseman, Frank McCormick. The American leaguers talk it up out there in the infield. The outfield is playing straight away. Here is a foul. He didn't mean to hit it. He was backing away from an inside curve ball. The ball hit his bat, and as he backed away, the ball went off to the right. He went out to the left, and it's a foul. It's ball one and strike two on Terry Moore. With a man on first base for the National League and one gone, they've scored a run this inning on Owens Homer. Big Al Benton is the second pitcher for the American League. Chandler started. Here's the next pitch, and there is a ball. It's just a little bit too close, and it's two and two. Ball two, strike two for Terry Moore. Crowds that plate, waves that light-colored bat around. Man on first base, Elliott, has a short leadoff. Here comes the pitch, and there's a swing and a foul. It's out of play. It's up into the stands, off there to the right, and it's two and two. Bertie Tebbett gets a new baseball from umpire Bill McGowan. Steps out and fires it out to the pitcher. The exclusive mutual broadcast of the All-Star Game from Cleveland will start at 8.45 Eastern Wartime. Remember that, fans. Tune in to your mutual station at 8.45 Eastern Wartime. Here comes the next pitch, and Moore hits a high infield fly. It's between the plate and first base, and the first baseman, York, is under it and has it for the second out. So there's two gone. Well, here's Frank McCormick coming up. He's no newcomer to all-star play or World Series play either. Frank McCormick of Cincinnati, a right-handed hitter. He's batting 249. He's hit 10 home runs, and he has 50 runs batted in. He's up there now with two out and a man on first in the last half of the eighth. The score is 3-1 to one in favor of the American League. They scored all their runs in the first inning. Here's the first pitch, and there's a swing and a foul. It's a slow curve ball just above his waist. He just got a piece of that ball and rolled it foul to the left of the plate. That, by the way, is the first pinch home run in 10 All-Star games. Mickey Owens, pinch homer, first pinch home run in 10 All-Star games. There's a ground ball to short. Boudreau gets it to play at second. Force out. And it retires the side. The play went from Lou Boudreau, the shortstop, to the second baseman, Joe Gordon. It was an easy force play, and it retires the side. And so the totals, fans, in the last half of the eighth, for the National League, one run and two hits. And now the game is going into the first half of the ninth inning with the score of the American League, three, and the National League, one. Now let's recount 
goes total, shall we, for eight innings of play. The American League has three runs, three, four, five, six, seven hits. The National League, one run, one, two, three, four, five, six hits. The National League had a hit in the third inning. They had a hit in the fourth. They had one in the sixth, one in the seventh, and two in the eighth. The American League had three in the first, one in the third, one in the sixth, one in the seventh. Ball game is now going into the first half of the ninth. The complete totals, the American League, three runs, seven hits, National League, one run, six hits. Now here's the new pitcher, Bucky Walters is in. Bucky Walters has come in for the National League. He's taken part in 18 games. He's won nine and lost six for the Reds this year. He's pitched 127 innings. He's allowed 114 hits. He's walked 39 and he struck out 57. Well, fans, we're going into the ninth inning of this great ball game at New York. Mutual Broadcasting System has brought you an exclusive presentation of one of America's greatest classics. Here's Walters. There's a ball that's high. The first man to bat for the American League is Gordon, who has a record tonight. He struck out three straight times. There's a bouncing ball to short. Shortstop coming in fast. There's the peg. He's out in a close play. Reese to McCormick. Reese, the Dodger shortstop, came in fast for Gordon's smash and threw him out. One gone. They're running up against a time limit. Remember, the game will end at 9.30, regardless of whether the National League has their last bats or not. Now here's the third baseman, Kenny Keltner. Bucky Walters is getting all set. Here's the pitch. It's a swing and a long fly ball down the left field line. It's foul. It's way over the stands. Boy, that was really a poke. Kenny Keltner's been up three times. He bounced out. He popped out twice. Bounced out the first time, and he popped out the second time and the third time. Walters is all set again. Here's the next pitch to Keltner. There's a strike. It's right down the middle. A fastball right through there, and it's called. It's two strikes now on Kenny Keltner. The American League leads 3-1. to one. We're in the ninth inning at New York. Here comes the next pitch, and there is a swing, and there's a fly ball down the left field line, and it's foul. Off to the left, and it's still two strikes on Kenny Kelton. Kenny Keltner batting with one out. Pitcher gets all set out there again. Here's the next one. There is a swing and a miss. He struck him out. He went for a wide curveball that time and struck out, and there's two gone. And that is eight strikeouts. Eight strikeouts. For the American League, eight of the American Leaguers have gone down on strikes. Now here's Bertie Tubbets. Tubbets, a right-hand hitter up. Here's the pitch. There's a strike. It's called right down the middle. Don't miss the big all-star game from Cleveland tomorrow night at 8.45 Eastern Wartime. Here's the pitch. It's a ball low. Mutual will again bring you the all-star game tomorrow night. Mutual Broadcasting System leads the way in the presentation of America's leading sports event. There is a half swing. The ump says he went a little bit more than half, and it's a strike. Makes it ball one and strike two for Tebbets. Birdie's been up three times. He's caught a fine game tonight. He struck out the first time. He popped out the second time, and he struck out the third time. The game must end at 9.30 because of a blackout here in New York tonight. Here comes the pitch. There's an infield fly. The third baseman, Elliott, is coming over near the mound. He's right under the ball. He's out, and it retires the side. And so the National League will get their time at bat. No runs and no hits. And this can be said for the American League. And let me say it right now. The boys are not stalling at all. Everybody's hurrying right out there. And I really think that the American League wants to see the National League get their last time at bat, which they're entitled to. They're all hustling, getting out there on the field so that the National League, running up against a time deadline, will get their bats in the last half of the night. Pitcher Al Benton is out there. Let's see the hitters we have coming up are going to be Melot, Country Slaughter, and Ernie Lombardi, and those fellas can really slap that apple. Benton is getting in his practice throws. The winner tonight will play the We'll play Uncle Sam's team at Cleveland tomorrow night. The team led by 
My old friend Mickey Cochran, the former manager of the Detroit Tigers, will play the winner tonight in the big stadium at Cleveland. I broadcast the All-Star game there a number of years ago, and it's a beautiful layout. That was the year that Fox hit a long home run over the left fielder's head. I'll never forget it, and it was a great ball game. So fans, you fans in Cleveland, of course, will be out there for a great cause tomorrow night. All that money goes to Army-Navy relief. And so we want to remind you fans in Cleveland that there's still good seats available. Get out and see that ball game tomorrow night between the winner here in New York tonight and the service team. And you fans across the country, wherever you happen to be listening, whatever state you're listening in, Mutual will bring you the colorful story of that great game. The time will be 8.45 Eastern Wartime tomorrow night. Now here's Mel out up. Benton gets all set. There's a swing and there's a foul. It's off to the right. Tebbett's chasing the ball. Maybe out of play. It's in the stands and it is out of play. It's a harmless foul. One strike. Left-hand hitter Mel out up. It's the last half of the ninth inning with the American League ahead, three to one. The American League official totals are three runs and seven hits. If the American League wins, of course, Chandler will be the winning pitcher and Cooper will be the loser. Gets all set out there now, taking his time. There's nobody on, there's nobody out. Benton is ready. Here's the next pitch to Ott. Ott takes a ball. It missed the corner and it's one and one. Boy, what a, what a moment this is, fans. I know that you can feel the tenseness that we feel here in New York. As the National League up for the last time, with seven minutes left to play, the deadline before the blackout in New York, Mayor LaGuardia was very kind to set aside the time, to give baseball more time tonight. You know, this game was supposed to end at 9-10, but there was an unavoidable delay in starting, and so Mayor LaGuardia very graciously gave baseball a little longer time, right up until the actual deadline of the blackout, which is 9-30. Getting all set again. Here's the pitch. There's a swing, and there's a foul that the first baseman may have a chance on. He's going back, and it's going into the stands. A foul ball, and it's two and two on Little Mel. Now Bertie Tebbets gets a new baseball from Bill McGowan. Tosses that ball out there. Well, the American League, as you know, scored their three runs in the first inning on a home run, a double, and another home run. And the National League scored their run in the eighth inning on a pinch home run by Mickey Owen. Now he's getting all set again. It's two and two on up. Here it comes. It's a swing and a foul tip, and it got away from Tebbets, and he's going to get another swing. Looks like Bertie was hurt with that foul. Tebbets went down on one knee, but he's getting up now and seems to be okay. Well, it's been a wonderful sight here in New York tonight. These fans that have jammed into these stands have really enjoyed it, and Jim and Mel and I have really seen a grand ball game. We hope that you've enjoyed it on the radio. Here comes the next pitch, and Ott hits a pop-up right in front of the plate. The catcher, Tebbets, is down the line just a few feet and takes that ball 20 feet down the line toward third and one foot inside the line, a fair ball, and Ott is out. So, fans, two more now, and the ball game will be over. Now the next man to come up, a left-handed hitter, is Eno Slaughter of the St. Louis Cardinals, a great ball player. This fellow can run, he can field, he can hit, and he loves to play ball. There's five minutes left here in New York. Getting all set now. There's the wind-up, and here comes the next pitch. And there's a swing and a foul. One strike. American League three and the National League one. That's the setup. Nobody on and one gone in the last half of the ninth. Here comes the pitch, and there is a foul. It's right up here to the right, just to the right of our booth. Catcher Tebbets gets another new ball and fires it right out there to Benton. Country Slaughter batting for the National League with nobody on and one gone. Benton is all set. Here comes the next pitch and Slaughter takes one in the dirt. A ball. Ball one and strike two for Eno. Up in there batting left-handed. A red nine in the back of his white uniform. American League infielders keep up a constant stream of chatter. Here comes the pitch, and there is another ball. He almost hit him in the leg. He was going to go for that one. It was a sinker, and he started to go for it, but he pulled his bat in time, and the umpire calls it a ball. The outfield of Williams, DiMaggio, and Henrik that's gone all the way is playing slaughter straight away. It's about four minutes left. They'll get their bats all right. He's getting all set again. Here comes the next pitch, and there's a swing and a hopper foul to the right of the plate. Slaughter starts down the first baseline, but the umpire, Bill McGowan, yells foul. He tells Bertie Tempest to throw that ball away, flips him a new ball, and the American Leaguers peg it around. The next man to come up after Slaughter will be Ernie Lombardi. 
Bill McGowan is getting a new supply of baseballs now in his blue serge suit. Al Benton is the second American League pitcher tonight. Chandler started. He's getting all set again. Here comes the next one to Slaughter. Slaughter swings. There's a long fly ball to dead center, but Dimaggio is out there backing up. He caught it, and there's two gone. Country Slaughter hit one a mile that time towards center field. But Joe Dimaggio raced back about 35 or 40 feet and pulled it down, and there's two gone. And now, friends, here comes Ernie Lombardi, the last hope of the National League. Here's Ernie Lombardi. Here's the first pitch. There's a strike. It's over the outside corner. Two out and nobody on in the last half of the ninth inning. American League three to one. Here comes the next pitch to Lom. Lom swings and misses a change of pace pitch in around his knees. And the pitcher made him look bad on it. It's two strikes on Lombardi. There's two out. One more out and the ball game is over. And the American League will play the service team in Cleveland tomorrow night. Now Al Benton is all set again. Here comes the next pitch. He hit the high fly ball to right field. Looks like it's all over. Tommy Hendrick is in under the ball. And he caught it. The game is over. And the American League defeats the National League in New York in the 10th annual All-Star Game. And here are the totals. The American League, three runs, seven hits, and no errors. The National League, one run, six hits, and one error. The winning pitcher in the ball game is Chandler. And the losing pitcher is Martin Cooper. I want to give my colleagues who worked with on the broadcast with me tonight just a chance to say goodbye we're going to have to get off in a hurry and here's Mel Allen we're swell working this game with Bob Elson and Jimmy Britt it was a beautiful ball game to watch a lot of swell pitching only one uh, half inning which was any great deal of offensive fireworks in the first inning when Lou Budrow homered and Rudy York homer with the Tommy Henrik on base who had doubled prior to York's homer it was really a swell ball game to watch wish you were all here all right here's uh, Jimmy Britt the fact that this game had a blackout deadline to make added to the suspense and drama of the final innings. It was an all-star game worth remembering, and the American League is going to give Uncle Sam service nine in Cleveland tomorrow night a real battle. Well, thank you very much, Jim and Mel. It's been a real pleasure to work with you tonight. I'm looking forward to tomorrow night with working with Wade Hoyt and Jack Rennie over at Cleveland when Mutual will bring you an exclusive coverage again of the great all-star game at Cleveland at the big municipal stadium. The players are getting off the field. The American League players are shaking hands with each other, and so are the National League players as they go off the field. And the final score again is the American League 3, the National League 1. The winning pitcher is Chandler, and the losing pitcher is Cooper. And now this is Bob Elson saying good night from the Polo Grounds in New York City. We return you to our New York studios. We wish to thank the makers of Philly's Cigars, sponsors of Cal Tinney and Sizing Up the News, usually heard over many of these stations at 8 p.m. Eastern Wartime for their courtesy in relinquishing their time this evening so that we might bring you the broadcast of the All-Star Baseball game. Mr. Tinney will be heard at his regular time Wednesday evening. Gabriel Heater, usually heard at 9 p.m. Eastern War Time, will be presented over his regular network immediately following station identification. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>